Hello again, Irish fans, and welcome to this evening's Notre Dame football Saturday night watch party. Tonight, we take a look back at the 2004 matchup between Notre Dame and Michigan. The game took place on September 11, 2004, the third anniversary of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. There were moving ceremonies all across the country on this day, honoring the lives lost in the attacks, including ceremonies before the game on the field at Notre Dame Stadium, ceremonies NBC carried live on the national broadcast. The game was originally scheduled as the opening game for both teams, but when Michigan scheduled a game with Miami of Ohio the week before their game with Notre Dame, the Irish responded by scheduling a visit to Provo, Utah. Michigan won at home, and the Irish lost a tough one to BYU on the road. The eighth-ranked Wolverines came to Notre Dame as the favorites, but the Irish did not agree with the pundits and used a dominant defense and an explosive second-half offensive performance to claim a come-from-behind victory. Our guest tonight is one of the stars of this big Notre Dame win, then-sophomore quarterback Brady Quinn. Brady, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Yeah, thanks for having me. You know, this was, um, this was always a special rivalry, Jack, for a lot of different reasons. Um, obviously, there's a lot of history but between Notre Dame and Michigan, that played into it, I think, whenever you took on these, um, you know, a rival like this, two of the most winningest, successful programs. And then when you add in September 11th and, and how I think that weighed on a lot of people's minds and how they were impacted by it, um, that played a role. And, and then I think for a lot of the players, especially guys in the Midwest, you're usually recruited by both schools. Um, schools had a lot of similarities. So you knew the coaching staffs, you knew a lot of the people within, some of the other players too that maybe chose to go to Michigan uh, instead of Notre Dame. Uh, and because of what happened the year before this game, yeah. I'm not sure people are aware of it. We lost 38 to nothing. Game day was there back in 2003 in Ann Arbor. And Mickey Marotti, one of the best strength coaches in the country, now Ohio State, he made us do 38 reps of whatever it was that next offseason. So the spring, summer, you'd be doing a leg press of 600 pounds. And he'd say, give me 38 reps. And you're looking at him saying, there's, there's no way. They said, and that's the problem, is, is you guys are thinking that there's no way you can do something. You have to think whatever your goals are, they're obtainable. Um, and so this, we try not to circle matchups. This one meant a lot to a lot of people for a lot of reasons. And it was maybe even one of the reasons why, you know, we got off to a slow start um, in the beginning of this game offensively, but also lost to U or, excuse me, BYU uh, week one. I think we had focused so much in training camp on this matchup, on this defense offensively, that maybe we overlooked BYU. And you just set the stage so perfectly for why this particular game with Michigan was so important. But some of the younger fans may not remember that Notre Dame and Michigan used to play every year, beginning in the late 70s. And when you got on campus, that year in and year out, resumption of the rivalry was continuing. In fact, you played Michigan four times and beat them twice. So try to explain. Everybody says that Notre Dame USC is the number one rivalry, and you can't argue with that. But in my years here, I've sometimes gotten a sense that there might even be more dislike at times between Notre Dame and Michigan. Talk about the intensity of the rivalry. Well, I would argue that. I would argue that the Notre Dame-Michigan rivalry, because of proximity, because of how similar the schools are, you know, our run versus USC when I was there was a little bit tougher. You know, back then, um, they were as talented as they gets. You know, you're talking about Alabama Clemson in regards to recruiting and talent and all that. Now, granted, some of that got wiped away because of what they were doing to get some of those talented recruits. But uh, it was different. You know, with Michigan, it, there are so many similarities. And, and like I said, because the schools are in such close proximity, you ran into a lot of different people who either rooted for one or the other or maybe like both. But uh, that played a big role in it. I mean, for me personally – I almost went to Michigan. Mm -hmm. So there was a piece of me that every time we took on Michigan, I wanted to prove and look across the field at, at the guys across from me and say, yeah, I, I made the right pick. Uh, so my freshman year in that 2003 game, I never, I didn't get until the very end. I think I had my first completion of my career to Anthony Bassano for a first down. Uh, but that was it. I mean, I, it, we got drummed bad. And, and I would, you know, leaving that field, I remember thinking I was excited that I got a chance to play. And I was excited about what was to come, but I was going, man, if that's what the standard is, we're far from it. So we knew we had a lot of work to do. That wasn't a you know, good season for us. But coming into this matchup, Jack, I mean, this was a top 10 team in Michigan. At that point in time, they were contending for the Big Ten and they were contending for potential national championships. So um, we knew exactly what you know, type, type of rivalry this was going to be every year. And I think that the, one of the reasons why I'd say it was 
a tougher rivalry than USC in some respects is physically you were so beat up. The week after you played Michigan, you felt like you were in a heavyweight boxing match. I mean, you didn't feel really like you had recovered until about maybe Friday or maybe Saturday of that next game week. Uh, it was just different because it was so physical like that. And, and this game, you know, kind of epitomized it because of the way the first half went. A defensive battle, one in which you were trying to kind of figure out the other team's scheme, but also just, you know, really trying to find an edge and trying to find a window of opportunity. Now, if you open the Notre Dame football record books right now, your name remains on top of virtually every Notre Dame quarterback statistical ranking, including all-time passing yards, completions, touchdown, passing leader for Notre Dame. When you signed with Notre Dame, is that the kind of impact that you thought you would have, that not only would you leave school leading in all those categories, but now, so many years down the road, that you would still be on top of all those categories? Honestly, no. Um, I couldn't have told you who owned what records or who had what. I mean, I remember my junior year when some of those records started to get broken and people would tell me things. I just, I didn't, I didn't care. I wanted to have a chance of winning a national championship. Uh, and, and, you know, we weren't able to accomplish that. I think we left the school at a better spot uh, after my senior year, going to back-to-back BCS games than, than where it was when we first got there. And obviously went through a transition too from Coach Willingham to Coach Weiss, which sometimes can, can be a little more difficult than people realize. But that was more my focus. It was more about the guys I came in with, wanting to make them proud, my family proud, Notre Dame, the alumni proud. Um, and, and so that was, it was more about that than stats. I mean, heck, uh, if, I wanted to, if I wanted to put up a lot of stats, I would have went and played probably for Texas Tech with Mike Leach back then in the air raid offense. And, and, then, and who knows how many you know, yards I would have been able to put up and all that. So it was never about stats for me. Uh, my, my thing is now looking at it, like, I'm rooting for Ian to beat him. You know, I, I hope Ian is able to take over this year and, and, and get – because that's a good thing for Notre Dame. That's a good thing for our team and where we are in regards to the national championship race. So, I'm always rooting for every one of those guys to continue to surpass it. And I talked to Ian uh, probably I, – I forget when I – in passing at one time when we bumped into each other. And I just said to him, man, you know, don't look at my records as what the ceiling is. Go look at what Joe Burrow did last year and the national records and say, that's what I'm trying to accomplish. That's what I'm trying to break. I'm trying to have the best single season ever that, that this country's ever seen. Um, that's, that was always kind of my mindset as far as like the things that I tried to shoot for, but it was never stat, you know, centric, if you will. Now I brought up all those terrific accomplish, accomplishments that you had here at Notre Dame, not just to pat you on the back, but to give some perspective because going into this game, the second game of your sophomore year, you weren't Brady Quinn yet. You were Brady Quinn, the young, talented quarterback with great potential, but you, haven't, you had not yet established yourself as one of the all-time greats. And the first half of this game was a bit of a struggle, both for you and the offense. Michigan put you on the ground a number of times. But the one thing that I noticed in watching it again that I remember from that game, you never got rattled. For a young quarterback, You had led Notre Dame to a road victory over a ranked Pittsburgh team the year before, but this would have been the biggest victory of your career to this point. You never got rattled in the game. How did you maintain your poise and help the offense maintain its poise as you guys gradually got momentum? I would say, honestly, boxing. You know, I started transitioning to box my getting to my high school or senior senior year of high school. And even when I was there with Tommy, he was a tremendous boxer, still fighting, still doing some of that. During Bengal bouts, we would go down the gym and, and do that. And you're probably going, where is this going? Um, I, you know, boxing is a sport where you know you're going to get hit. This was a matchup versus Michigan where you couldn't go into it thinking you weren't going to get hit. You had to go into the pocket, into the game, and, and understand that you're going to get hit. It's going to hurt. You got to get back up, and you got to keep, pro, you know, keep pushing along and keep delivering punches. And so – uh, especially in this type of matchup, Michigan, Michigan State, a lot of the more physical teams we played year in and year out, uh, that was always the mindset. And, and I really do feel like boxing attributed a lot to kind of that mentality of just staying poised, uh, even though you've got a guy across from you trying to take your head off punch you, and punch you out in a ring. And it's kind of similar when you're in a pocket. You've got this condensed space, and there's guys trying to come after you, guys trying to come after the ball. Um, and, and a lot of times after you're throwing, you get hit. you got to get back up. So – I always kind of took on that mentality uh, playing the quarterback position. And and just quickly, one of the things you mentioned 
not really establishing myself. Uh, I remember Bill Diedrich, our offensive coordinator and quarterback coach, had a come to Jesus moment with me after that BYU game. We had a two minute drive towards the end of that BYU game. And, and, and I guess he would describe the way I played that game conservatively. And he wanted to see growth. He wanted to see me take more chances. Uh, and there was a point where I think we had a pivotal, I don't know if it was a third down or fourth down, and I had thrown short of the sticks. Maybe it was a third down. Instead of taking a shot into what I thought was a tight window, and I didn't want to lose the game on that throw. And, you know, it ended up being tackled short. We didn't end up able to converting, and that was pretty much the game in BYU. And I remember seeing in the film session him talking to me and just saying that I was going to have to take more chances. I was going to have to take more risks. And I, I think that came out a little bit in this game, in particular with a touchdown pass to, to Matt Shelton. Um, and we can talk about that later on. But that was one of the tough things for me is, you know, you're talking about this being my biggest win. This was a moment for me, not only to prove to Michigan that I picked the right school, but to prove to my own coaching staff, to prove to my own teammates that I was going to be the guy. And Brady, this is already a moment for the Notre Dame football online game watch. As you know, I've been here for almost 40 years and I just learned something. I had no idea that you were engaged in boxing in your years here at Notre Dame with Tom Zivikowski, one of the toughest guys ever to play for Notre Dame, who went on to a professional boxing career. But we all just learned something, and that's always delightful. So we're going to have fun, folks. He, he, he gave me a fat lip. He, uh, <laughs> he actually – we I mean, we said no headshots. I think I might have even had headgear on, but he was preparing for one of his fights, and I would go and let him kind of beat me up for a little bit. And I, I get a couple shots in on him. He's got a vicious left hook, but – he, uh, he caught me a little bit. I remember going in the class the next day, sitting there. I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of lick, I got my, like a, a bump on my lip. I'm going, I wonder if anyone notices I've got a fat lip right now and if I'm going to hear about this. But um, it, it was a great form of training. Tom Suttis, who used to be there and helped train a lot of the guys for Bengal bouts, he was a close family friend of ours. So he wanted me to continue my boxing training when I got there. I thought it was very applicable for what you do as a quarterback. Well, folks watching, we have settled on this format where we're going to go to the NBC broadcast now, and Brady and I are going to jump in periodically. Now, we've already been very upfront. Almost all the first half highlights uh, are defensive. So you're not going to see Brady and I again until the second half, but then you're going to see us a lot for big plays on both sides of the ball because, as you now know, Brady is also an accomplished analyst for Fox. So you don't really need me for much more other than to tee Brady up and we are going to do that. And Notre Dame, very tough, great defensive first half. You'll enjoy that. You're going to enjoy everything about the second half. So right now, let's join the NBC crew of Tom Hammonds, Pat Hayden, and Lewis Johnson for the start of this evening's Game Watch 2004, Notre Dame and Michigan. Notre Dame Stadium sold out for the 174th consecutive game for a renewal of one of college football's greatest rivalries as the Michigan Wolverines take on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Notre Dame Stadium after those uh, moving pregame ceremonies. Tom Hammond and Pat Hayden ready for uh, the match between the two winningest teams in the history of 1A college football. And, of course, the Michigan opened up at home with a win over Miami of Ohio last week while Notre Dame lost at BYU. And Michigan, can you imagine being a freshman playing your first game in college and starting before 100,000 people? That's what Chad Henney did, and he came through big time. Well, yeah, this is a pretty good story. Four months removed from his high school graduation leads to that opening game win, his first road test. Really played well. 58% completion percentage, led the team on five drives. But if you were either a freshman or a senior, what you really want is some really talented wide receivers, and Michigan has a bevy. Not one, not two, but three. Jason Avant had over, about, uh, over 800 yards in receptions last year. Steve Breston, last year against the Irish, had four punt returns for 105 yards. But the premier receiver on this team, perhaps in the country, Braylon Edwards, believe it or not, 85 catches last year, 14 touchdowns. Among the three of them, Tom, they had 170 receptions. This is a tough matchup for the Irish. Arguably the three best receivers in all of college football. And for Notre Dame, normally the home opener is a time of great anticipation, of optimism, but there's sort of a cloud hanging over Notre Dame football after that uh, loss when they didn't look very good at BYU. Well, I know clouds in the forecast really because of the funk that their offense continues to be and did not play well offensively. Only 11 yards in rushing last week. Tyrone Willingham yesterday generally as optimistic as a Boston Red Sox fan. fan. Seemed a little bit down, but he thinks he can get this to 
turn around, but it's important their offense on this first drive gets something started. Michigan won the toss, and they deferred, so they kick off, and Notre Dame will return it with Chase Anastasio. As we take a look at this series history, Michigan with an 18-12-1 record. The last meeting was at the Big House last year, and Michigan pumped Notre Dame 38 to nothing. something the coaches and players at Notre Dame have been reminded of all through the summer and into this fall beginning of the 2004 season. Brady Quinn, the freshman quarterback of a year ago, has matured 26-47, 265 yards. The big question, would Ryan Grant be able to play and start today? He did not play against BYU. He had over 100 yards rushing two years ago. He's in the lineup and gets the call and is stuffed at the line. Larry Harrison leads the charge for the Michigan defense. So Grant does get the call and his first carry nets very little. Here's a look at the starting lineup for the Irish with Harris, Morton, Sullivan, Stevenson, and Lavore. An offensive line that's been much maligned. And the remainder of our Adidas starting lineups, Powers, Neal, Grant, Stovall, McKnight, and Palmer. Yeah, and this offensive line, four returning starters. I think they have a chance of being a pretty good offensive line, but they're going to have to play a lot better and protect Brady Quinn a lot better, better than they did last week. Quinn appeared to be changing the play at the line of scrimmage. Grant able to dodge the first couple of tacklers, and then Harrison gets him again with help from Lawrence Reed. It'll be third down for the Irish. That guy's a good tackler. He is. That's Lawrence Reed, their number one tackler, had six in the opener against Miami. Harrison, Watson, and Massey up front. Manning, Reed, McClintock, and Woods. Two of the best corners you'll find anywhere. Jackson and Curry, along with the safeties, Mundy and Shazer. You know, the Irish have had a difficult time implementing their version of the West Coast offense. But in a West Coast offense, in a third and five, you know, you pitch a ball out, let a guy run after the catch. It's like an extended handoff. Nickel defense for Michigan. Quinn with plenty of time to Stovall. And Stovall short of the first down. Sure tackle by Ernest Shazer, the safety. And they get it underneath again. No first down. Yeah, in third and five, either you got to get the ball in the flat to a guy who can catch it and run for a first down. Or if you're going to throw it down to the wide receivers, you get it. You must get past those first down markers. I think two or three times last week against BYU on third and long, they dumped it short, way short of the first down markers, and had a punt. And that time, Quinn had plenty of protection. Here's DJ Fitzpatrick for his first punt. He's been averaging 42.8, 10 punts at BYU. And Breston is deep for Michigan. Good punt by Fitzpatrick. Breston steps out of bounds. It goes out of bounds. So Fitzpatrick did a good job of preventing any return by Breston and still booted it 47 yards. Chad Henney, the freshman, going to come out on the field. You see his numbers from a week ago. But, Tom, what I was most impressed with is how he managed the game. Only one penalty all of last week for Michigan. Sometimes got, the toughest thing for a freshman. Absolutely. Got the guys in and out of the huddles, made the right, uh, you know, the calls, got the protection right. I mean, I think that really is the hard part. A veteran and big offensive line for the Wolverines as we look at our Michigan Adidas starting lineups. Dudley Underwood, Edwards, Avant, and Massacoy, the tight end. First down play for Henny. It's a handoff to Underwood, and he only gets a yard before he is stopped. Both teams intent on stopping the run by the other team today. Goolsby and Zibikowski with help from Buttonzak. As you see, Tuck, Pauly, Landry, and Buttonzak up front starting for the Irish. The linebackers Lloyd Goolsby, the leading tackler, and Curry. Goolsby back after missing last year with injury. Burrell and Zibikowski, the starting safeties. Ellick and Jackson on the court. Well, Justin Tuck, right down here, is going to have to have a big game and big season for the Irish. Two sacks last week. Henny, a short drop, fires across the middle, incomplete. And there's a penalty marker down, first flag of the game, intended for the tight end, Massacor. Mike Goolsby, the middle linebacker, calls their defensive signals, a guy that was out all last year with injury. As you see, number five, Underwood down. But Mike Goolsby, a guy that they desperately need in their defense. I thought there was there's a penalty against Michigan, the referee today, Dave Wivwet from the Big Ten, Big Ten crew, working today's game. As you see other scores in college football this second week of the season, second full week. Underwood, of course, is the senior from Madisonville, Texas, top rusher after that first game against Miami, getting his chance to play. Eligible down the field. Defense. Penalty is declined. Third down. 
Third down that, coming that, up. That can't be right. An eligible receiver uh, defense? No, I just said it wrong. Yeah, okay. Um, Kent Bear is the defensive coordinator for Notre Dame. And Underwood getting his chance to play with Chris Perry departing. Being tended to on the field right now. As you said, you grew, you grew up in Madisonville, Texas, and a lot of his teammates from high school went to University of Texas, but always dreamed of starting for the maize and blue. Right through his hands, Goolsby falling on him. And this is a guy that's waited for his opportunity behind Chris Perry. You know, he waited two years to get this chance. Kind of struggled a little bit last week. 22 carries, only 61 yards. The coaches said, you know, we got to get him going. He's a powerful guy, but he danced a little bit too much last week. Wanted him to hit the hole harder and sooner, right? Yeah, he said, you know, the coaches said, it's not a sock hop. You know, we need to kind of run it up in there. While they tend to David Underwood, we'll take a break and be back to Notre Dame Stadium. Six foot, 209 pound junior from Milwaukee replaces the injured David Underwood. And on third down, four wide receivers, Avant, Edwards, Breeston, and Reston and Gonzalez. Nickel defense from the Irish. Henny's pass complete. Edwards stops short of the first down. Braylon Edwards with his first catch after making six in the opener a week ago. Good defensive series for Kent Bear's team. The first defensive series here at home. Got him the, the freshman quarterback in a third long, played a little soft, forced everything in front of him, and a good tackle on the dangerous Braylon Edwards. So Adam Finley is on to punt, and look who's deep. Yeah. Carlisle Holiday, the former quarterback, now wide receiver, returning punts. He, Raymond got, McKnight, uh, Raymond McKnight had been the returner against BYU. But, but Tom, I think if Notre Dame's going to have some, some big plays this year, they're going to come from that guy, number seven, Carlisle Holiday, and the Notre Dame coaches have to find a way to create a, a holiday package, if you will. Finley's boot sailing deep. Holiday. Dodgers the first man, and the second, and then upended home at about the 32-yard line. Tackle made by Scott McClintock on special teams, a 49-yard punt, and Holiday brought it back nine yards. Well, the, the Irish offense has really started slowly over the years, and you see that it's failed to score in the first quarter 11 times, and I think it's really gotten their offense out of sync. They've always been playing catch-up by mid-second quarter. So Bill Diedrich, the offensive coordinator, hoping to find a package that will click in a scoreless game. Three and out for each team on its first possession. Fasano resets a tight end. McKnight in motion. First down pass. Quinn. And it's intercepted. Intercepted. Picked off by Marcus Curry. Say that, that is tremendous coverage by Marcus Curry. He had two interceptions last week in their opening game. He even up one of 11 Division one players who had two interceptions in the first week. Comes up with his third. Marcus Curry and Marlon Jackson on the other side. Pretty good protection here by the offensive line of Notre Dame. The guys up front doing their job. Just a poor decision here by Brady Quinn because Marlon, uh, Marcus Curry is all over the wide receiver. He was indeed, and his protection breaks down. He should have just thrown it away there. No chance to complete that one to Powers Neal. Perfect position by Curry. So the first turnover of the game, and Michigan has it inside the 40-yard line of Notre Dame. Here's Braylon Edwards in the flat. Tackle made by Tom Zivikowski. First to hit him. Then Brandon Hoyt arrives on the scene. A gain of about five yards on first down. You know, Braylon Edwards is a guy that's had a remarkable career. Could have left for the National Football League. Probably been the number one draft pick. Decided to come back. He's had two seasons of over 1,000 yards in reception. Trying to become the first Big Ten receiver to go three, uh, three seasons doing that. But a guy that can do everything. Catch the short passes, break some tackles, and then go over the top as well. And his streak is intact. He's in motion here. That's Braylon Edwards. Penny with a draw play handoff. It's to Jerome Jackson. And Jackson, who carried seven times for 25 yards and a touchdown against Miami, gets the first carry here. You know, Tom, as, as impressive as Braylon Edwards is as a wide receiver, what I, you don't see too many stars, and he's a star wide receiver, block or have a willingness to play without the ball that Braylon Edwards does. And his blocking, in fact, all three of the wide receivers, they turn those five-yard runs into 20-yard touchdowns. Third down and two. Two tight ends, Massacoy and Eckert for the Wolverines. Edwards in motion. Henny, roll out. 
Deliver. Complete. And Edwards dives ahead for the first down. Braylon Edwards makes a catch and knew right where that first down marker was. Made a dive and picked it up for the Wolverines. You know, Terry Malo, the offensive coordinator for the Wolverines, even last week in Henny's very first start as a true freshman. You know, he let him kind of settle in a little bit. Great catch there again by Edwards for the first down. But some aggressive play calling as the game wore on for Chad Henney. And, and as I said, I, I think he got off to a great start last week. He struggled a little bit earlier, early in the game, but I think his players appreciated the way he responded. First down at the Notre Dame 25. Hand off to Jackson. And Jackson plowing ahead to the 20 before Goolsby and Hoyt drag him down. Remember we talked to Mike Goolsby yesterday and said, we need to win in all three facets of this game to be this good Michigan team. Well, you can't turn it over the way they did here deep yeah. in their own territory either against a good Michigan team. There's Goolsby, the senior from Joliet, Illinois. Joliet Catholic High School, where he was Illinois Player of the Year and an All-American. Missed all of last season with an injured shoulder and just talking to him bad. The boy, they really killed him, didn't he, to have to sit out and watch his teammates play. Particularly for middle linebackers, those guys want to play you know, two times a day, <laughs> double headers. Second down and five. Edwards again in motion. Henny over the middle. Will it be ruled incomplete? Incomplete? Yes, incomplete pass. Brandon Hoyt knocked the ball free of Tyler Ecker. And it's ruled incomplete. No turnover. And he was a line judge very quickly called uh, incomplete. Good, real good fundamentals by Henny. Gets back, gets sets, get rid of the ball. That looks like a possession to me. Looks like a catch. Yeah, that looks like a catch. Looks like it could have been or should have been a fumble. Threw the ball to Ecker. Had possession of the ball with his feet on the ground. So a break for the Wolverines. Brings up a third and five. Edwards in motion. Henny. Pass caught by Edwards. No, he dropped it. No, incomplete. Nice hit again by Tom Zivikowski. The sophomore safety from Arlington Heights, Illinois. Quinton Burrell there, too. And boy, the ball comes out of there awfully quickly. A ball that should have been caught yeah. by Braylon Edwards and picked up a first down. But Chad Henney had a lot of steam on him. He's got an incredibly strong arm and an accurate one as well. So the field goal attempt by Garrett Rivas, who hit four of six extra points. And a 31-yard field goal against Miami last week. This one, 38 yards. 38 yards to give the Wolverines the lead. On its way, it is good. So Michigan converts the interception into three points. The first turnover gives Michigan the lead with 8.29 left in the first. Wolverines three, Irish nothing. Already three interceptions for Curry, who had only two all last season. And Neenberg ready to kick off for Michigan. Anastasio and Stovall are deep for Notre Dame. Anastasio from the five. Good special teams coverage by Michigan. He only gets it back to the 15-yard line. Hey, Tom, let's go back to that one play that was ruled an incomplete to Tyler Eckler, the tight end of Michigan. I, I still think close call. He's, he's the tight end right down here. A little short pass over the middle. But I think this is a catch with possession. Catch there, feet down, and then the ball comes out. I think that's a fumble. They called it an incomplete pass, and they went on to score three points on the field goal. And that's the difference right now. 3-0 Michigan. Notre Dame takes over in its own 16-yard line. Quinn with a handoff to Marcus Wilson. Wilson bounces to the outside and then sandwiched by a couple of defenders. Marlon Jackson got a piece of him. And also there was Shazer. So looked like he had a little running room outside. And then it quickly closed for Marcus Wilson, who comes into the game as the number one rusher for the Irish with only 22 yards gained against BYU. You know the story if you subtract the sacks, as is the case in college football. The Irish had only 11 yards rushing against BYU. But if you add those back in, it's only 38 yards yeah. rushing time. Second down. Wilson again. Other side. Same result. 
Back him on a lost a yard. Lawrence Reed was the first to hit him, 42. Well, it was one of those uh, games last week. If you look at an Irish fan, you have good news and you have the, you know, the bad news as well. Brady Quinn, 55% completion percentage, which you should have that at least in a West Coast offense. Defense played very well. Head Bears defense got 22 yards rushing allowed, five sacks. The bad news, we talked about the rushing yards, only one offensive touchdown and three of 16 on third down, which they're facing right now. Ryan Grant back in, spread formation, four wide receivers. Quinn in trouble, unloaded it to McKnight, but McKnight stopped a yard short of the first down. Tackle made by Pierre Woods and help from Scott McClintock. Uh, you know, a little bit of blitz from the outside. McClintock in Marlon Jackson, the corner. But see, that frees up one of the defensive linemen to get into Brady Quinn's face. And they force that's a good blitz there by Scott McClintock, McClintock right off the side. Almost had him, but yeah. But McClintock, an inside linebacker, their fastest non skill player. So this Fitzpatrick for his second punt. Preston is deep. And Breston deep for Michigan. Sorry, Pat. That's okay. Excuse me. Breston, a dangerous punter to Short punt this time. Fitzpatrick did not get all of that one. That's what happens sometimes, Tom. I think when you're worried about a punt returner, when you try to kick it too high and you don't get much distance on it. Only 32 yards on that punt. Jared Clark downs it for the Irish. Michigan gets it back, leading 3-0. Leach with Michigan leading Notre Dame, 3-0. And the Wolverines, good field position again. They begin at their own 43. Henny fakes a handoff, rolls to the right. And his pass deflected and incomplete. Zimikowski got Zimikowski. a tip on it. To he did. Yeah. And Edwards nearly caught it anyway. Yeah, a real, oh, nearly an acrobatic catch by Braylon Edwards. You know, he makes those remarkable catches and the easy ones. But I think it was Zimikowski, number nine, who gets his hand on it right up here. Watch a hustling. Gets his right hand on it and prevents a big play in the Wolf Race. Happened there for a moment. Yeah, he did. The xylophone players. I'd like to be the band leader and replace the xylophone every year. You know, you got to find two new xylophone players. Second down play. Henny in the flat. A big hit by Dwight Ellert. Ellert stopped Breeston in his tracks. Breeston in his tracks. And a loss of about four yards. Yeah, Terry Malone, the offensive coordinator, creates some plays for Steve Breeston to kind of create some runs. A little bit like, you know, the Irish are thinking about with Carlisle Holiday, but that time incredibly well run, read by Dwight, Dwight Ellert. Who not only read it well, then he just kind of come down and makes a great tackle. Lucky there's not a fumble there. Preston, yeah, lucky to hang on to it. His three Irish gang tackled him with Ellick the first to hit him. Here's a third down and 15. Again, if you're a quarterback, you always take a look at where number 44 is, Justin Tuck. Preston in motion, resets. Penny under pressure, set. Justin Tuck. The sack specialist got him at the 30 yard line. There's a flag down. I tell you, Justin Tuck is so quick and he is so much stronger than he was a year ago, Tom. You know, he's got three sacks this year, all of them face mask against the Irish, I think. But three sacks, all of them on that inside move. He fakes upfield and then comes back down underneath. Guy who has 21 career sacks, two sacks against BYU, and playing the run a lot better. And as I said, you need you better put a tight end over at his side to make him go a little bit further. But the penalty against Notre Dame. First of all, Justin, face pass from 95 defense. 15 yards from the previous spot. Automatic first down. That's Victor, Abby, and Mary. One of the new rules this year. They announce the number of the offending player. Watch how quick, you know, he takes him upfield. Hello, Jay. And then right back in, inside and then over the guard, Matt Lentz. Might have been tough to grab the face mask instead of Abby and Mary. Right there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely was on tough. So first down for Michigan. And a nice run. The flag is down. Another flag. Jerome Jackson showing some running ability there. Gain of 10 yards. Quentin Burrell finally made the tackle, but a hold against the Wolverines. Well, you know, 
know, Tom, as, as long as the stars have come out at night, Michigan has always tried to start a game by establishing the run. And they did not run it particularly well last week. Boy Carr was really upset with that running game and really wants to be able to feed his tailbacks, the three or four guys, and have one of those 200-yard games on the ground. Holding. Offense, number one. Ten yards from the spot of the foul. Repeat first down. Braylon Edwards who goes to the sideline and gets a look from Coach Carr. For much more on the Fighting Irish, log on to NBCSports.com. Click on a special section, NBC's Notre Dame Central. Pat has analysis. You can get complete post-game coverage of today's Michigan-Notre Dame matchup at NBCSports.com. Tom, a little disappointed. You've downgraded me. I used to be expert analysis. <laughs> We're well, waiting to see. Down Actually, down the me. jury is still out. <laughs> Very disappointed, Tom. Only four carries, five yards rushing for Michigan so far. Another rushing attempt to Jackson. Gets nothing. A loss of a couple. Trevor Lawrence was the first to get there. You know, that, that deja vu all over again kind of feeling. Struggling on offense, playing really good defense. Kent Bears team. We talked to Kent yesterday, and we talked about the BYU game. BYU had 16 offensive possessions. Right over here is the man who makes the, the play, the nose tackle. Good push, good chase on the backside as well. See, there's no cutback lane, and Trevor Laws made a real nice play. And Kent Bear was saying to us yesterday, I really like my inside guys, guys like Trevor Laws. Second down and 20. Edwards in motion. Kenny fakes the handoff, rolls to his right, and his pass caught by Avant. He went right upstairs to get it. Big catch by Jason Avant, his second of the season. How would you like to be a you know freshman quarterback and have this trio, this Bevy? You know, Bevy's now one, Bevy's now two, Bevy's three. Have three receivers like he has. This time Jason Avant, 6'1", is about 6'5", on this catch. He gets the foot in bounds with possession. You know, really a sure-handed guy and one of those very, very competitive people on the team with a lot of competitive athletes. He went for 15 yards, setting up a third down and five. Third and four, just between four and five. Avant resets to the left. Breston in motion. Henny, his pass complete. And Breston dives for the first down. Let's see where they mark it. Looks like he has it. Quentin Burrell tackled him, but Breston with a dive to pick up the first. You know, Michigan has always been able, has seemed to be able to mash the football run in, but they can throw the ball surprisingly well. 271 yards a game last year with the experience of John DePaul. Well, what I like is the play call. I mean, they're, they're not holding anything back from Chad Henney. Well, certainly Notre Dame has been able to stop the run for Michigan. That was what they hoped to do, and then put pressure on the freshman. So far, it hasn't bothered the freshman one bit. Would you love to hear a coach one day just say, I don't care how many yards they run for, I'm going to stop the pass this week. That's what I'm really out to do. There's a handoff to Hart. And his first carry, that's about eight yards. Tackled by Carlos Campbell and Quentin Burrell. So Boyd Carr is... 25th year as a coach, assistant and head coach. In fact, no one has been on the sideline longer than Lloyd for a Notre Dame-Michigan game. Longest tenures on the coaching staff. Pretty good names, huh? Field and Yost. Famous names in the history of college football. You mentioned that. This is his 19th Notre Dame-Michigan game. Edwards in motion, second down. Henny with a handoff to Hart. Close to the first down, stopped by Goolsby. Okay, you see why Kent Bear missed Mike Goolsby last year. See those, those shaved arms he has? He has a little pregame ritual on Fridays. He shaves his arms and he shaves his legs, which is kind of interesting. And then he puts on a couple of rubber bands on his wrist for good luck. And then his pregame meal, believe it or not, is a hostess cupcake with orange juice. Obviously not on the Atkins diet. So he doesn't like to eat much before a game. He does eat at halftime, though, he said, too. Goolsby... Only a guy 6'4", 240, do you not question him shaving his arms and legs. Said it makes him feel faster. <laughs> well, he's played pretty well in this first quarter. Third down and one. Jackson manages to pick his way forward for the first down inside the 25 of the Irish. Brandon Hoyt and Dwight Ellick, but not until Jerome Jackson has the first down. Boy. 
What about the late Gar interesting guy we've talked to in the for the last half dozen years, Tom, right? Taught high school English and history for seven years for twenty thousand dollars and he told us his first football pay job was a whopping eleven thousand dollars. But he's kinda of hung with it. You know, you sense that he kind of loves it or appreciates appreciates it more. He does indeed. I think he's uh, had time to sort of take a step back and enjoy all the positive things about the experience. Here's Jackson again. Jackson with a short game. Let's go down to the sideline now. Check in with Lewis Johnson. All right, Tom. Well, the Michigan running back core is still missing David Underwood, number five. He has been on the bench for quite a while. Uh, he's been tended to by the trainers. They've looked at his stomach area. We have no definitive answers to what the problem is because Michigan does not release injury information. But Underwood has been pleading with the trainers to please let him back in the game. As you see, he talks with the trainers right now. They're still not allowing him back in the game, and he is frustrated. Yeah, Lewis, you're right. He's a senior that has, you know, one last shot at making his mark. Second down and ten. Penny play action fake under pressure. Steps up and pass deflected incomplete. That is Derek uh, Landry, number 66, who got his hands on it right there in the middle. But I, Chad Henney, the, the fundamentals of this rush, he, he must have had an awfully good high school coach. He gets back quickly. He does some drift. You know, offensive linemen always like to know where their drop back pass is. You drift right or left, you give up a sack. And then he stepped up into the pat pocket there and avoided a sack. And last year in high school, while all his friends were on spring bait, break down at the beach or whatever, he came to Ann Arbor, watched film, watched spring practice, and got a head start. It shows he's 5 of 10, 36 yards so far. Third down and 10. Breston in motion. Henny. Pass complete underneath. Breston makes one move and another, but stops short of the first down. Now decision time for Lloyd Carr. Quentin Burrell stopped him to prevent the first down, so it is decision time, and it looks like the field goal unit will come out. Yeah, you know, his defense is playing, playing so well. Right. I think this is the right, right call. Kick the field goal, and the Notre Dame offense is struggling a little bit. Kick the field goal, try to go up by six points. Well, you're a master of understatement there. All right. Struggling a little bit. <laughs> Well, the West Coast offense, you know, clearly has gotten stuck in on Lake Michigan. That's... Rivas, who hit one earlier, will attempt this one from 33 yards. Sends it on its way and right through the uprights. Rivas hits his second of the game. So what do we know about this Notre Dame team? It's going to be a team, looks like, similar to last year. They're going to have to create a lot of turnovers on defense and be efficient in offense. They trail 6-0. In 6 nothing, a unfamiliar and disturbing trend for Tyrone Willingham. Season outscored 124 64 in the first quarter. You know, and so this is what you know the defense has to make a play or special teams. Maybe a big return here, a 30 or 40 yard return. Gets them, you know, lights a fire. Neenberg's kickoff taken by Stovall at the goal line. Maurice Stovall. And again, they stop him short of the 20. This time uh, about the 16 where they stopped Anastasio the last time. So the special teams in Michigan looking much better today than they did against Miami. Tim Jamison on special teams makes the Michigan tackle. The Notre Dame's had three series so far. They had a three and out, then an interception, then a, then a three and out. And, uh, you know, it always falls on your quarterback. Brady Quinn, the sophomore, had a pretty solid season last year, starting nine games as a true freshman. They just need to find a player or players that can go 20 or 30 yards. And I think maybe one of them's in there now. Darius Walker, the freshman from Lawrenceville, Georgia, highly touted, makes his first appearance. Fake it to him. Quinn rolling. He's going to keep it. And Brady Quinn tiptoeing down the sideline, stepped out of bounds. He had a big long game. But he'll be marked out of bounds at the 21 yard line instead. Marcus Freeman blocking for him. Quinn stepped out of bounds on the final play of the first quarter. That could have been a you 15-20 know, yard gain right there. And he is out. His left foot hits it, and then his right. But nice play on first down for Brady Quinn. So it'll be second down for the Irish when we start the second quarter. At the end of the first, Michigan 6, Notre Dame nothing. Back after this from your local station. We start the second quarter with Michigan leading Notre Dame 6-0. Tyrone Willingham and company shut out in a first quarter once again. They have yet to pick up a first down. 
Michigan has 61 total yards, 22 for the Irish. On second down, a handoff to Walker. And the freshman from Lawrenceville, Georgia, understands uh, what the college game is all about on one hit from the Michigan Wolverines. They stopped him in his tracks after that brilliant high school career in which he broke Herschel Walker's run. It's pretty good company, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and they're looking for somebody to replace the, you know, the plus 20-yard gains that Julius Jones had last year. He had most of the team's dynamic plays, and they need somebody like that. It's going to come from Darius Walker or Carlisle Holiday. One of the wide receivers, because it's hard, very hard to be methodical and drive 80 yards every time you get the ball. Pitch to Grant on third down, trying to turn the corner. Here's Ryan Grant, hit hard, and he's close to the first down, maybe short. So it'll be Mark Short as Lawrence Reed, who seems to be everywhere for the Michigan defense, hit him when it looked like he was going to be able to scoot for the first down with a head of steam. That, that's a strong run, though, by Ryan Grant. You know, here's a guy that came into this game. We weren't sure he was even going to be able to play. Held up last week because of a, a sore hamstring. And that was a tough, tough run. And I think you mentioned earlier. It's a couple close of, enough they're going to uh, measure, Pat. Yeah. Sorry. A couple of years ago against Michigan right here, he had a big game, 132 yards and a couple of touchdowns. And a determined run by Ryan Grant. Get him the first first. I thought it was uh, short, but it was not by the half the length of the football Notre Dame picks up its initial first down. But, but watch the effort after the hit. He gets turned. I mean, that's an incredible blow that Reed gives him. Just kind of keeps his momentum moving, picks up the first. Now, you know, it's only two or three extra inches, but, but a significant play. Absolutely. So after the 17th consecutive game in Notre Dame Stadium that Notre Dame has not led after the first quarter, they're trying to mount a drive here to start the second. Darius Walker's back in at tailback. Here's Walker, the freshman, trying to use his blockers. Hits the hole, broke a tackle across the 30-yard line. Nice run by the freshman. Yeah, you know, I think the biggest adjustment for high school running backs, Tom, well, there's really two of them. One of them is not so much when they pitch you the ball on the run. It's it's pass block, you know, picking up those blitzing linebackers who are 250 pounds and awfully good. And, and the second thing is really securing the football. In college football, there's a lot more stripping of the ball than you're going to find in, in, in high school. Walker picking up five yards on that one. Second down and five. Nice little drive here for the Irish. Walker again. Around the corner. Lowers his head. Picks up another first down. Marlon Jackson and Ernest Shazer get him out of bounds. But the freshman Darius Walker giving the Notre Dame running attack a boost with help from a nice block from Anthony Fasano, the tight end. Yeah, and Mark LaVore and Dan Stevenson. Dan Stevenson, the right guard, just went up and gave the freshman a little high five. You know, again, Mark Stevenson actually is, or Dan Stevenson, 6'5". Walker's only 5'11", but it did manage to be a high five. <laughs> It was a very good blocking on the right side by Stevenson, Lavore, and Fasano. So the ball now for 38 of Notre Dame. First down for the Irish. And Walker started to go inside, then ducked outside, and was nothing there at all. Maybe should have continued with his first move, which was where the blocking appeared to be. Marcus Curry made the tackle for Michigan. But, you know, this, this is what Notre Dame really needs. It's kind of a, a drive where they get that running game going a little bit because it gives everybody confidence. It's a coaching staff confidence, and particularly the offensive linemen. And, and you know, you, 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 this is a, should be a good offensive line. Four returning starters, two highly recruited players, and Ryan Harris, the left, uh, left tackle, John Sullivan, the center. It's a chance of being a very, very good offensive line. Ryan Grant back in at tailback. The lone setback and a four-wide receiver set on second and nine. Brady Quinn. With time. Has his man, Stovall. Maurice Stovall in the midfield for another Irish first down. Game of 11. You know, this is the first glimpse of the West Coast offense we've seen in a couple of years. I'll tell you what, Martin LaVore on the right tackle on the night of 73. Great block protecting Brady Quinn. Right over here. You know, he, he, and then Brady Quinn just steps up and fires the ball. And you see, perfect ball placement. He allowed him to catch the ball and turn and pick up the first down. See, 22 catches all of last season. Nine of those came from Purdue. Five games without reception. Maurice Stovall's the guy that has to step up. So much potential, and everybody's still waiting for him to break out. From midfield, first down Irish, Darius Walker. Walker. It's about four yards. See, Carlisle Holiday, number seven, is in for the Irish. We talked about him a little bit. You know, last time 
Notre Dame came in here as the quarterback. And the guy that I just think some at some point in the season he's going to throw probably you know at least a touchdown pass, maybe several. It's going to be a factor they hope in the punt return game, maybe some slip screens. It's a guy that had almost 700 yards rushing a couple years ago. Tackle made by Lamar Woodley as Michigan resting its starting linebackers. Woodley, Harris, Burgess in there. Crable was also in there. First time now Notre Dame has been in Michigan territory. Fake to Walker. Quinn under pressure. Throws it at the feet of Fasano. Incomplete. Was Larry Harrison, number 96 for the Wolverines that uh, was in Mr. Quinn's face. Larry Harrison was a guy last year. Didn't play a lot. Only made 12 tackles, but three of them were for losses. So significant plays that Harrison made. I tell you, Brady Quinn is, is a tough guy. I mean, I think his teammates respect his mental and his physical toughness. Survived a lot of sacks, a lot of hits last year, and has become the leader of this team. Third and six, Grant the setback. Quinn, rush, got it away. A catch, not made, incomplete. Stovall couldn't hang on. Now Maurice Stovall has a reputation not being able to get away from bump and run coverage, but that time he made a nice adjustment to jump up and catch the ball. I thought he had it for a while. Yeah, it looked like he had it in his hands. But then I think it was a good defensive play that got stripped out of his hands. Getting away from the bump and run, you talk to the coach, just, to just waiting for it to just happen. Has not the first three years. Leon Hall, number 29. Looks like, it looked like the, the ball sort of came down in Stovall's hands, then off the helmet of Hall maybe to knock it loose. In any event, incomplete, so Fitzpatrick will punt. Reston calls for a fair catch and takes it at about the 13-yard line. So Notre Dame finally picks up some first downs, but eventually they have to punt. A 34-yard punt backs up Michigan inside their 15-yard line. In six, Notre Dame nothing. And Michigan with the ball on the Wolverine 13. Hand off to Jackson. Not much there. Got a couple yards in the center of the Notre Dame defense. Bring up second and long for Chad Henney and company. See Henney checking his wristband for the play call. Yeah, you see, you see that flip phone yeah. wristband? You see a lot more of that in college football. We were talking to Brady Quinn about that, and he said, what, that they had 170 plays? Yeah, about twice as many as they had a year ago, but it's uh, the expanding waistline of offensive linemen and expanding wristbands of quarterbacks. <laughs> St. Edwards in motion. Looks like a blitz coming from the Irish. Henny's pass incomplete off the hands of Braylon Edwards, who was defended by Derek Curry. And next Monday, Heather Locklear and Blair Underwood star in LAX. The stories we never hear about the place that we all know, one that Pat knows very well. LAX premiering this Monday, 10, 9 Central on NBC. I'm in and out of LAX a lot. Are you in that? Uh, considering your previous uh, experience as an actor on the love boat, when you were titled The Green Boat, I think that be nice. Come on, be nice. Does that mean you're not in it? No. no. Third down and eight. Draw play. The handoff to Redbert. Stop short of the first down at the 20-yard line by Brandon Hoyt. You ever notice when Brandon Hoyt hits you, you go down no. how many yards after the hit? And of course, two fumbles last week against BYU. A great story. Hoyt's poetry, a published poem, actually. With the tackles in the end, the contaminant. <laughs> Gave a reading, as I recall, last year here at uh, Notre Dame of his poetry. Meanwhile, that's Carlisle Holiday awaiting the punt from Adam Finley. How, how about a block punt attempt? He had three punts blocked last year. Irish come, and they almost got it. Holiday fumbled, picked it up, trying to get to the corner. Flag is down, and Holiday is down the sideline, cutting back. Seven, but the flags went down. Looks like it's going to come back. A 29-yard return after a 47-yard punt. And a block in the back, I think. But you, you, you kind of see the, the kind of plays that Carlisle Holiday, there's the penalty against the yard, that, that can give your team. And I just believe, Tom, they need to give him some, some chances. Throw him a quick screen, pitch him the ball, let him run it, let him throw it. During the return, illegal block in the back. On the returning team, number two, 10 yards from the spot of the foul. 
ball, first down. Freddie Parrish, number two. I think he's right here. I yep. think that is number that two. Is. Yeah, there's a block in the back right there for sure. Yep, that is number two, Freddie Parrish, the fourth. Got a hit with a flag, you see that? <laughs> So a big return, nullified by a penalty. Irish backed up to their own 30 when we come back. Back at Notre Dame football presented by Lowe's. Notre Dame coming off its best possession of the game so far, their last drive. Bill Diedrich, the offensive coordinator, really has to be happy with that last drive. And Darius Walker kind of kind of sparked it. You know, five carries, 18 yards for the freshman. He's in a tailback now. The fullback is Josh Schmitz. And off to Walker. No, fake it to him. Quinn has got it. Going for a wide open Stobart. He has it. Stobart will play on the run. That's the big play they've been looking for from Maury Stobart. Was that Peyton Manning on that fake? A uh, perfect, excellent, executed fake by Brady Quinn. I mean, he really hit that ball, and Maurice Stobart right down the gut of this Michigan defense. Ryan Monday made the tackle to save the touchdown, but Stobart was wide open. Yeah, but what? Watch the ball thing. Right there on his left hip. I mean, I don't think anybody sees it. Then Stovall, perfectly thrown ball. Nice catch with his hands. And then Mundy prevents uh, him getting into the end zone. But that's a, a well, well executed play and well designed play by Bill Dietrich. 49 yards. First down, Notre Dame. Walker to the outside. Made one man miss. He's at the nine yard line. Mundy forced it out after a gain of 12. As the freshman shows a flash of brilliance. Absolutely. He is absolutely giving him a lift. We talked to Tyrone Willingham yesterday about Darius Walker, and he said, you know, he's just one of those running backs that sees things that other running backs don't see. He said he's got great speed, great balance, and he's absolutely provided the spark. In fact, uh, Bill Diedrich was saying he makes people miss, which is what he did right there. He certainly has some good outside speed. First and goal, Irish. Ball just inside. The Michigan eight-yard line. Walker, nowhere to go. Lost a yard. Ernest Shazer was there right away. And Ernest Shazer, number 25. In, in, in a lot of Big Ten programs, he could play linebacker. He plays, see what he did last week, plays strong safety for Jim Herman's defense and Boyd Carr's defense. A, a guy that can play up close to the line of scrimmage, but they use him back in center field a lot. Had an 88-yard return, or interception return for a touchdown last week. Shazer, 6'4", 229. That's a good size, strong safety, isn't it? Yep, senior from Detroit, King High School. Growing confidence of um, his offensive unit of Notre Dame. Second and goal from the 10. Wide open. McKnight. A short tackle by Marcus Curry at the two-yard line. Well, Curry prevented the touchdown as McKnight was rolling to the end zone. And Marcus Curry has an interception and prevents a touchdown with that tackle. But I can tell you, Irish fans have to be happy with what they're seeing in the finally the West Coast offense perhaps has arrived. You know, the little, the little five-yard throw, a little bit of a run, almost gets in the end zone. Big third down right now for Notre Dame. Third and goal from the two-yard line. Freeman and Fasano, two tight ends. Walker, the setback, the fullback, Schmidt. Walker, pounding ahead, stops short. It'll be fourth and goal from the one, and decision time for Tyrone Here's the crowd. And he was just asking to get back in the ball game right in front of Tyler Winningham just a moment ago. At left tackle, Bob Morton has, or left guard, excuse me, Bob Morton has been replaced by Dan Santucci on this series. See if they go to the right side behind Stevenson and Lavore. Powers Neal, fullback. Grant, tailback. Grant, stop short. Stop short. Michigan with a great goal line stand. Happy. Great defensive line penetration. Roy Manning is part of that defense that got underneath the offense. Of, I still like the call. I mean, I still like the call by Tyler. Yeah, penetration, yeah. yeah five, five white.
red jerseys there. No, no window there to get in the end zone. Or just wing helmet. Six, six wing helmets. <laughs> So a goal line stand, but the Wolverines preserves their 6-0 lead. Six nothing Michigan after a superb Wolverine goal line stand. Okay, watch number 58 with the second guy in here. That's Roy Manny. Just gets really early penetration, kind of blows up the fullback. That's the lead blocker, so there's no one really there to lead Ryan Grant in the end zone. Now the Wolverines take over at their own one-yard line. Try the center of the line for a yard or two. We were talking to some of the Wolverine players this week about the play of Chad Henney, their freshman quarterback. And Braylon Edwards, I said, I thought was kind of interesting, he said to us, you know, he was so calm in the huddle last week. He said, I was more nervous than Chad Henney was. <laughs> and, you know, I think players, offensive linemen in particular, know, they can sense, they can feel when the quarterback's not confident. What they have is a really confident young quarterback in Chad Henney. Notre Dame has taken the lead, as you saw in total yards. Henny's hit 50% of his passes so far. Second down and eight. Jackson. White Ellis hopped on him. Good defensive series so far for Kent Bears. Irish defense played well last year, played well in week one. Sacks, and he said to us yesterday, we must play great run defense. So we have the last couple of plays. It's going to be third down and eight for Michigan. Again, I, I would get an extra body on, Ju on uh, Justin Tuck if I'm a Michigan coach. Just don't want Justin Tuck, number 44, to get a free reign or just a single block. He's and lined up at the uh, left defensive end. Jackson is the running back. He's cut down here. Dudley, the fullback. Henny, handoff, nothing for Jackson. So Michigan will have to cut from their own end zone. Nice play good. there by Derek Curry. Very, very conservative play call, but they did what they had to with their freshman quarterback, bring in the punt team. And Notre Dame rushed the punter last time. This is a good time to allow Carlisle Holiday to perhaps return this one. You're going to get good field position. Don't risk roughing the punter. Finley. Averaging 49, there's Holiday awaiting this latest boot. Rush was not on. Here's Holiday. Feels it cleanly and right up the center of the field. Holiday cuts back to the 40 yard line. 14 yard return after Finley's 40 yard punt. Tackle made by Tyler Ecker on special teams. Well, last month in Athens, the world came together for competition and patriotism. And next weekend, don't miss golf's ultimate battle for pride and country. That's the Ryder Cup. Tiger Woods leads the Americans on their home soil, looking to reclaim the cup from Team Europe. The Ryder Cup begins Friday, 8 a.m. Eastern and Pacific on USA with continuing coverage Saturday and Sunday on NBC. It'll be in Michigan this year. Yeah, Oakland Hills, great old track by Donald Ross. Oakland Hills South, built in 1918. You know who the first pro was there? I know because I heard it earlier. Oh, Walter Hagen, though, Good guess. one of the great names. Darius Walker stopped after a short game by Larry Harrison. It'll be second and long. Really important drive, I think, for the Irish. Not for this game, but I think just the confidence for their season. Four minutes remaining in this first half. They have all three of their timeouts remaining, and they're on a roll. They've got some rhythm. They're running it and throwing it pretty well. Grant back in on second down and eight. Short drop. Was that intercepted? It deflected incomplete. No, intercepted. Intercepted by Monday. Well, through the hands. Is that Samarza you're trying to of, Shimmer, of Jeff Samarza. And into the hands of Ryan Monday, who picked it up off the turf. Yeah, a little slant to the, to the left here. Good throw. Just goes right off his hand. Good coverage there. First by Marcus Curry. I think he got his hand on the ball. Knocked it up in the air. The free safety Monday. Who intercepted a pass last week. Boy, look at that. was a great catch, too, yeah. because uh, just got it before it hit the, hit the ground. Now, Jim Herman's defense created seven turnovers last week. Monday had one.
interceptions, two fumble recovers. Two Irish turnovers have been costly. They still trail. Lynn twice. Although the lane swing was not really his fault, deflected ball. Ryan Mundy got his second interception of the season after going all last season without one. Henny, first down, plenty of protection. Lost it for Edwards downfield. And Alec, no, it's caught by Edwards. Alec came down with a two. Possession goes to the offensive player. Unbelievable adjustment by Brandon Edwards. Yeah, and you called it right. You know, if they both catch it, it goes to the offensive offensive player. Good coverage by Dwight Alec. But the leaping 6'3", Braylon Edwards. Over, you know, 85 catches last year, over 1,100 yards, 14 touchdowns. Notre Dame wide receivers, by example, total caught eight. He caught 14 last year. Slows down, goes over the top, not pass interference. That's a beautiful catch by Braylon Edwards. I mean, he's got football charisma. It goes for 45 yards. Michigan first down at the 35 of Notre Dame. Blitz and a screen pass set up. Caught by Hart. Michael Hart gets about nine yards before he's knocked out of bounds by Derek Landry. Now, so far, this drive is like a well-planned wedding. You know, things just kind of going right along. They throw the deep ball. They come back to the screen. They run the ball well. Good play calling by Terry Malone, keeping the defense on their heels a little bit. You got to stretch him out every once in a while. And geez, guys like Braylon Edwards give him some more chances. First uh, interception of Quinn led to three of Michigan's points. Trying to get some points after picking him off for the second time. And he hands off Hart to the 20 yard line. First down, Michigan. It'll be first down Michigan at the 20-yard line of Notre Dame, tackled by Goolsby and Burrell. Lloyd Carr's opening road game of this campaign. You see what's happened over the last four years. Some pretty tough games. Tough opponents on the road. Has not been terribly, terribly successful. And not expect, he's expecting Notre Dame to bring their best today. It's obviously not the 38-0 kind of, kind of game he had last year. Impressed with Chad Henning, Tom? Oh, yeah. yeah. He would never dreamed he was a freshman. Just went to the prom three and a half years ago, or three and a half months ago. I don't know. He might not have gone to the prom. He might have been studying film. <laughs> he hands off here to Rembert, and Pierre Rembert gets a couple of yards before he's uh, pushed out of bounds by Goolsby and others. But, you know, again, the play calling, what they're, they, have, they have a lot of confidence in Chad Henney to, to, to allow him to kind of throw the ball deep, throw the ball short. I mean, they're not really holding anything back. This is the guy that started all four years. It's Terry Malone, the offensive coordinator, started all four years in high school. Wilson High School, Pennsylvania, All-American, All-Stater, Pennsylvania Player of the Year. Over 7,000 passing yards and 74 touchdowns. Yikes, that's a lot. Delivers wide open across the middle to Massacoy. And the big tight end rambles for a first down inside the 10 of Notre Dame. It'll be first and goal, Michigan. Quentin Burrell, all he could do to bring down the 250-pound Massacoy. You know, the sequencing of plays, I think, is always the magic about play calling. You throw it deep, then you go with screen, you run the ball, you throw the ball the tight end. I mean, they, they've sequenced the plays beautifully on this drive. Massacoy is an interesting guy. Came into Michigan as a big wide receiver. He's 6'4", 250 now. But they moved him down to tight end, and he became physical. I mean, he wasn't one of those wide receivers supposed to play the receiving tight end. He can block. First and goal from the seven. And he's now over 100 yards passing in the first half. Delayed handoff to Jackson, and Brandon Hurts sticks him in the backfield. That's, that's a good word, sticks him. He's had two big tackles in this game thus far. <laughs> But when he hits you, boom, you go down. There's not much movement after you get hit. Terrific job by Jackson just holding on the football. That could easily have been a fumble. He cost two of them last week. When they call this in the practice drills, a form tackle. Yeah, well, perfect. A loss of three, setting down second and goal now from the 10. Got the playoff. And his pass complete to Edwards at about the six-yard line. Tackled by Zibikowski. It'll be third and goal for the Wolverines. 
Well, these three wide receivers, well, we've seen the tight end as well. The three wide receivers have already caught seven passes among them in this first half. And Braylon Edwards, the guy at 6'3", they, they like to throw those jump balls down here in the end zone, give them a chance to use that that height and that leaping ability. Terry Malone said he's one of those guys that can kind of jump out of the gym. Or the field, in this case. Well, you get the point. Right? You get the point. <laughs> Chad Henney, four for four on this drive. Third down and goal. Henny with a handoff. And Hart stopped at the five. Well, you know, surprising call on, on third and five when you have these three talented wide receivers. I mean, and, and Lloyd Carter said to us this week, we need to get the ball to our playmakers. So, and Henny had the hot hand. He had yeah. missed the pass on the drive. Absolutely. In a critical, critical situation, they decided to give the ball to their freshman, Michael Hart. And Goolsby, right, filling that hole, which was open for a moment. Okay, Mike Goolsby. He's had a very, very nice first half. So fourth and goal from the five, and the field goal unit is out. Rivas has hit two field goals already. This one will be 22 yards. He's made from 38 and 33. Play clock. Did he get a timeout in time? I think it's irrelevant, really, the distance-wise. But... Right. Looks like they called timeout to beat the play clock. The Notre Dame needs a needs a block. Yeah, only six yeah. seconds left, so the timeout useless too. Timeout, Michigan. They're first. And it gives us a chance to remind you that coming up it'll be the Lexus halftime show. Jimmy Roberts back in New York with all the latest news, scores, and highlights from college football. And then a very interesting feature here. A look at a disturbing trend in college football where athletes get college credit for just playing ball. Remember the scandal at the University of Georgia with uh, Coach Herrick, his son, giving uh, some tests to his basketball players that uh, defied belief. <laughs> Actually, that's true, isn't it? You couldn't say that about many tests, but that one maybe. Anyway, that's all coming up on the Lexus Halftime Show. Well, as, as we just mentioned, Notre Dame would really like to get a hand on this ball. And early in the season, I think special teams is what worries coaches the most. The security of getting the ball snapped, held, and up without getting a block. Matt Gutierrez, the backup quarterback, who would have been the starter but for an injury, is the holder. Man, the snapper. And Rivas, the kicker. 22 yards. No problem. Rivas boots it through for his third field goal of this first half. And the Wolverines up their lead to 9 nothing as the first half comes to a close. So three field goals, two of them the result of Notre Dame turnovers. And Michigan leads 9 nothing. The Wolverines also had an excellent goal line stand holding Notre Dame at the one-yard line. Let's go to Lewis. Thanks a lot, Coach. Defense has played so well, but what do you have to do with this offense with the two turnovers so far today? Well, I mean, that's it. When you have two turnovers, we've really stopped our own momentum. We got in a position where we started to gain some ground, gain some yardage on the ground, and that helped open up a few other things. And now what you have to do is be able to maintain that consistency, eliminate the turnovers, put one on the board, and then you got a hell of a game going. All right, Coach, thanks. Tom? All right, Lewis. So Coach Willingham finally seeing some signs of life from his offense. Absolutely. 9 nothing at halftime. Now stay tuned for the Alexis Halftime Show with Jimmy Roberts. And that's coming up from our New York studios as we renew one of the greatest rivalries in all of college football, the two winningest teams in college football history. 9 nothing game at halftime. Now we'll go to Jimmy Roberts after these messages and a word from your local NBC station. In the first half here, 9-0 Wolverines lead, about to get the football and set to kick it off for Notre Dame is Carl Joya with Breston and Jackson deep. There's Goya. Joya. Yeah, yeah the Irish fans would like to see him a lot on the field a lot more, wouldn't they? A walk on now on scholarship. Joya puts his foot to it. Taken by Breston at the one-yard line. And Breston, the flag is down. And Breston twisted down at the 40-yard line. A big return by Steve Breston, but a flag on the play. 
Tackle made on special teams by Anastasio. How about Ryan Robinson last week with Miami, Ohio against, against Michigan? He had 204 yards of returns. That counted. He had another one called back. He looked at very special. This one comes back as we check in with Lewis. All right, Tom, thanks a lot. Well, I talked with Lloyd Carr as he came out of the tunnel a few moments ago and asked him about this stingy Notre Dame defense and how is he going to counter that in the first half. He said, really, the, the problem is that they lost David Underwood, their senior running back, early in the game. So now he's running a lot of young running backs out of that backfield, which is a problem. Dropped some passes on offense, but he said overall he's pleased with the way Chad Henney, his uh, young quarterback, is handling it. And, you know, going back to last week, Tom, in that game against BYU, he asked Henney, were you nervous then? He said, yeah. He said, well, you're going to be nervous here in this game because this is a big scene, a big situation, but just settle down, take it easy. If you make a mistake, regroup. It would be a tough game for even a fifth-year starter to walk into. Tom? The game last week against Miami of Ohio when Henny performed so well. And a handoff to Jackson. Jermaine Jackson breaking loose for a gain of 12 before Tom Zibikowski tackles him. And the first play of the second half, a big run gain for the Wolverines. And you know, Tom, there's so much more to playing quarterback these days in college football than just dropping back and finding receiver and throwing the ball. We talk about managing the game, you know, getting guys in and out of the huddle so you don't have clock problems, you know, calling the, the protections, getting the formations right. I mean, he's been able to do all those things quite well. And he has a first down after that run by Jackson. Jackson again. This time stopped after a yard. Stuffed by the center of the uh, Notre Dame defense, Greg Pauly and others. Tom Zibikowski. Yeah. By the way, a very good fighter, Tom Zibikowski. 70 amateur fights. He was out in the lobby at halftime. <laughs> Muhammad Ali was uh, in the lobby of the press box here at halftime, so Zibikowski, I'm sure, would be uh, pleased to meet the great one, the greatest. Second down and 10. Nickel defense for the Irish. Fake the handoff. Henning being chased by Tuck. Still managed to get the ball away and complete it to Edwards. Look how strong Edwards is. Carries four Irish. Preston Jackson was first to hit him. And for a gain of two or three yards. Well, you know, you talked about being chased by Justin Tuck. That's a scary thing for any quarterback that's going to play against number 44, Justin Tuck. Stays at home. And what's the acceleration this guy? You know, he's 265 pounds now. Very good ball placement there, though, by Chad Henney. And look how strong it is. Six feet, he gets 500 push-ups every single day. Now doing you by quite a bit. 499. <laughs> Third and seven. And he's pass on target. But Goolsby makes an immediate hit. Brady, Mike Goolsby flew to the ball this entire game. This big play forces a punt that would lead to Notre Dame's first scoring drive of the game here in the second half. Goolsby finished with 14 tackles, including seven solo tackles to lead everybody in this game. Mike Goolsby was a tremendous leader for our team. Him, Derek Curry at the linebacker position, they, they really did kind of pave the way, and they were the heartbeat of that defense. Um, the star was obviously Justin Tuck, but that hit alone, you could tell. I mean, we're down 9 nothing in the second half. We haven't done anything, but it gave our offense a bit of a spark, a bit of a momentum on this next drive, and I think also some aggressiveness. And let's not forget who the hit was on. It was on Braylon Edwards, who was their best wide receiver in Michigan. And he was a guy that was talking and chirping a lot to our sideline. So when we saw that hit, it started to ignite us a little bit, I, I think, as a team, too, knowing how much trash talk was going back and forth. Now, of course, uh, you had Carlisle Holiday bringing punts back in this game. That was an uh, interesting new twist for your offense. Also, Darius Walker making his debut. He's going to have a couple of runs here as you start to get down the field. And then we're going to get uh, – back into it after you make uh, the biggest play for you in the game. Yeah, and, and one of the reasons why we needed to run the football is obviously we had to have some semblance of balance. You know, if you look at the front that Michigan's utilizing, it's three down linemen, that one stand-up linebacker, and then two linebackers. Well, we've got enough guys to block that box, and so we should be able to run the ball successfully, but that's how it works when you're going up against Michigan. I mean, it's usually a tough physical battle and trying to win those one-on-one -on -one matchups up front. Uh, and, and then Darius, and we'll get into some of his bigger plays, but uh, we've got some great stories to him. But Matt Shelton, 
was a guy who really became kind of that big play receiver for us this particular year because of his speed. Well, since we're, we're coming up on that big play pretty soon, talk a little bit about your expectations for number three Darius Walker this season. <laughs> so that's the thing. I mean, Darius came in as a freshman, and he had, he had beaten all of Herschel Walker's records. And so when that's the kind of tag you've got coming in, there's some high expectations. And he's got a big personality. I think his practice jersey was actually bigger than his personality, if that's possible. He – I mean, and, and the way he practiced compared to how he took the field and played in this game – was two totally different speeds. Like, he was the definition of a gamer because when he would practice, we were like, man, is he running full speed? Is this, this is the guy who, who beat all of Herschel Walker's, Walker's records? And, and then this game was the game where he just exploded. And you saw what he was capable of, how durable, how efficient he was as a runner. And, and in particular, some of the moves where he would just stun and freeze defenders and then juke and get by him. All right, you're going to like this play, so you know what's coming up. Just take us through it uh, right full speed, and we'll have the replays. It's a loaded box, and so we felt like if we were able to um, get one-on-one -on -one coverage on the outside, you know, we'd like to take a matchup and take a shot. And Matt Shelton was as fast as any player on that field, but not a lot of teams thought that when this little white guy ran out there from Tennessee, um, you know, looking like the roadrunner. Once those legs got going, man, he was tough to stop. He was tough to be able to handle. And in this particular play, wasn't a good job by me, to be honest. Off the play action fake, I should have got it up sooner to him. Ball was a little bit late, uh, but I put it in at a high enough spot where once he beat him, he, he was able to go up, elevate, make a play on the football because he had already beat the defender. But that started to become a running theme uh, for us with Matt Shell and the rest of this year. And certainly when you decide to come to Notre Dame, you know all the home games are on national TV but you've got more eyeballs watching when it's Notre Dame in Michigan. And I think that was uh, one of the times earlier in your career where your athleticism and, you know, I thought it was a pretty good pass. You may have uh, needed to throw it a little sooner, but uh, there aren't many passes prettier on the highlights than that one you threw the shelter. Here it comes again. <laughs> well, maybe not in this game, but yeah, I mean, the biggest thing was I was trying to work the other side. I believe it was Stovall on the other side. Um, okay, yes. Like the height matchup, but again, you know, coming back, I knew Shelton was going to have the speed with it. And so the biggest concern was their middle of the field safety, just making sure that whichever way I was going to go with the football, I could look him off enough where he wasn't going to be able to make a play on it, um, whether it was Stovall or whether it was Shelton in this case. Uh, but as you can see, I mean, Matt went up, made a great play, uh, and, and and this would again become a threat now. As once he lined up outside, you started to notice as the season wore on. And even, even in games like this, teams were like, all right, I played seven yards off this time. Maybe I'm going to play eight or nine, and I'm going to give him a little bit extra step just because of his speed. So now it's 9-7. What is your feeling as an offense? Finally getting into the end zone, did you feel that the momentum was shifting to you? Yeah, we, we did. And I think the other thing that we felt was, you know, we were running the football. We had a decent average. And then once we felt like we could hit him with some big plays – that really opened everything up for us because now they can't stack the box. They can't get that extra defender in there to stop our rushing attack uh, and put it all just on the pass on third down. So I, I think it also gave our coaching staff some confidence, to be honest with you. Uh, as you watch the rest of the game, you start to see some of the play calling. Um, that started to loosen up as well. And I think they even felt more confident and more aggressive. Now, Michigan's defense was good. They were still tough. So you would need the defense to continue to play well for Notre Dame and they do. And the next time we join you folks, it will be after another big play by the Notre Dame defense. By two points in a, uh, in a rivalry game. Boy, Cora talked to us this week about the three rivalry games that they have on their roster this meeting. You know, they have Michigan State and Ohio State, of course. We said this is one that has perhaps more national attention. All, all, all college football fans follow this score. Well, it is the uh, two winningest programs in 1A. For many years, Michigan had more wins. Notre Dame had a better percentage. But with a win over Miami of Ohio, Michigan also took the lead in percentage. Michael Hart is the tailback. And penalty flags for delay of game. You mean, you mean the sense that momentum change you yeah. know, going on? Big Mo. Kind of play of game. Players. Offense, number seven. Five yards. The down remains first. Only the second penalty for Michigan this year. That, that's... Hard to do coming off the bench like that with the, uh, with the game penalty. 
Meanwhile, Chad Henney continues to wield a hot hand. He's hit six for six. 12 of 18 overall. Play action fake. Henny looking downfield, going deep. Edwards can't get there. Did it look to you, Pat, that the Edwards really wasn't running full speed? He, he did. You know, you know, the other thing is you got to try to keep the ball in play to give your guy a chance. But I don't know whether he was expecting that ball, but he looked like he was the number one receiver. He is wearing one. A little stop and go. Ran one of these earlier, made a real good adjustment. He just couldn't find the way. He did stop. Felt, felt the ball was going out of bounds. We had a nice adjustment on one earlier. You know, we talked about him having football charisma. We had a chance to talk to him this past week. Interesting guy. Very good student. 4.0 last semester. Right. His dad, Stanley, was a Michigan football player and NFL player. Graduate in December. Play action fake. Henny delivers this pass. Oh, Edwards made a sparkling catch as he turned around to make the grab in front of Dwight Ellick for 11 yards. You know, nice play by Michigan, but if there's better ball placement, he catches that maybe runs for the first down, right? It's just one of those plays as you watch the tape tomorrow, you'll say, nice, great catch, and, and Chad, you know, hard throw, but if you get it out in front of him so he doesn't have to turn back, maybe he can pick up another four or five yards and gets the first. Well, Braylon Edwards, though, is the real deal, that's for sure. Third down and four now for the Wolverines. Three wide receivers, Savant, Edwards, and Breston. Henny from the shotgun. Crossing pattern, Breston stops short of the first down by Carlos Campbell. And in this Notre Dame defense, and the offense has picked up, Notre Dame defense has played well for a game and a half. And that was a big play, a big tackle by Carlos Campbell right there. Preston Jackson, Dwight Ellick, Carlos Campbell. Campbell was beaten twice last week on long plays, but makes a great stop there, force a punt. Adam Finley back on the field for Michigan. Fifth punt will head toward Carlisle Holiday. Has over 5,000 career punting yards. That's a good or bad stop. Yeah, not necessarily <laughs> what you want to see. Gets his foot into this one, and Holiday standing at the 15, fields it. Double clutch, flag down. Shazer was the man flying in the face there to make the tackle. Holiday probably should have made a fair catch on that one. No, they didn't give him an opportunity to catch it, did they? Could be it. I saw number four kind of run right by him. Darnell Hood. Punt was 42 yards. Six on the return. Let's see if that holds up. Interference with the opportunity. Kick catch interference. 15 yards. First down. That was Darnell Hood. And there it is. That caused a holiday to double clutch. He got control. And before that, big play made on defense by Carlos Campbell. Prevented the first down, and the Irish take over with good field position. Two, first down at their own 36-yard line. And Darius Walker back to the line of scrimmage. Not much more as we check in with Jimmy Roberts for an update. Jimmy? Jimmy, uh, I tell you what, the Cardinals have a lot of offensive weapons. Make no mistake about that. Quinn's pass intended for Holiday. A little hand fighting going on with Marcus Curry, and it's incomplete. A terrific block there by Darius Walker. We talked earlier about one of the things for a, a young running back is to be able to you know, pass protect. One of the big adjustments for high school running backs, but I tell you, Darius Walker did a terrific job of picking up a blitzing linebacker, number three, right there in the middle of your screen. Right. Yeah, right there on Pierre Woods, the outside linebacker from Michigan. 
And excellent coverage by Curry to knock the ball away from Holiday. So third down and ten. That'll be five yards. It'll make a third and 15 as Dan Stevenson moved early. Well, Dan Stevenson's played well for the Irish. And only the third penalty on Notre Dame this game. False start. Offense, number 74. Five yards. The down remains third. You know, the, the Irish have had two explosive plays this game, which we didn't see a lot of last year in the passing game in particular. Maurice Stovall had that one long catch and then the touchdown catch by Matt Shelton. And we need another one now. Careful here, though, on third and 15 with Jackson and Curry, those two excellent corners for Michigan. Quinn across the middle, and ball is intercepted, deflected and intercepted. Marcus Freeman should have had it. Lawrence Reed instead comes away with it for Michigan. You, know, you, you pick up the stat sheet tomorrow, you say the quarterback threw a third interception. That was not Brady Quinn's fault. A perfect throw inside to Marcus Freeman. He had to throw it hard because there was real tight coverage. And I think he would have picked up the 15 yards for the first down. Right down the gut. Patty, right off the shoulder. And then Lawrence Reed, who's done such a good job stopping the run, picks up the interception. Well, with good hands, just snatched it right off the grass. Freeman makes the tackle, but another turnover, the third of the day for the Irish, that have led to six points for the Wolverines. Hand off to Hart. That's a good linebacker point, Tom, for both teams. Indeed. Hart stopped at the line of scrimmage. Notre Dame has succeeded for the most part in stopping the rushing attack of the Wolverines who lost their starter David Underwood early with an injury. Only 46 rushing yards for Michigan on 22 car carries and this is Kent Bear said to us yesterday we've got to stop the run for first force them in a second and long and third and long and they've done it and that's why it's a two-point ball game. Three interceptions by Notre Dame by Michigan off Notre Dame and two of those the hands of the receivers. That one complete just a yard short of the first down to Ecker, the tight end. Tackle made by Mike Goolsby. Okay, Tyler Ecker probably made the most significant catch for Michigan all of last year in the fourth quarter against Ohio State. 30-yard catch to keep a drive alive, seal a win over their uh, you know, arch enemy, Ohio State. Didn't catch a lot of balls, but very productive. Came back after a uh, two-year Mormon mission last year. It's third down in the yard. Jer Jerome Jackson is the running back. Dudley is the fullback. Dudley in motion. Pass. Henny to Edwards. Edwards goes one on one and gets the first down. He got by Ellie. Buttonzak then came to get the tackle, but not until Braylon Edwards had the first down. You know, Lloyd Carr can surprise you. you know, he's been there 25 years. He looks like a football traditionalist. He won with defense. He won the special teams. But on a third one, when they really need it. With a freshman quarterback. Freshman quarterback, they throw the ball outside. But, but why not when you have Braylon Edwards? So the drive continues for the Wolverines. They lead it 9-7. Trying to convert another Notre Dame turnover into points. Just under seven minutes to go. Third quarter. Henny sets up a screen pass incomplete over the head of Jackson. As when defensive linemen read that screen, screen early, it's Derek Landry, and I think it was Trevor Laws as well. They read that screen early, they have forced that quarterback to lob it. Boy, that's a dangerous throw, and Preston Jackson was almost there. The front seven for Notre Dame, all the entire 11 on defensive play. Corey Mays comes in at a linebacker on second and 10. Look at Zibikowski. One of the safeties. Gets it out in the flat. Sure tackle of Rembert made by Preston Jackson. Hey, one thing we know about Notre Dame is good tackles. There haven't been a lot of broken tackles in this ballgame. They'll bring up another third down for the Wolverines. We've seen a lot of blitzing out of Notre Dame against Chad Henney. And maybe there's a such respect for these three outstanding wide receivers. You don't do that. But... This would be a great time to bring some people, try to get a sack, take them out of field goal range. Third down and eight from the 30. Kenny, they pick up the blitz, but the pass deflected and incomplete. 
It may have been Derek Curry from the 49 one of the linebackers who got his hands on the ball, his strong hands on the ball. Of the field goal team. And Already, Garrett Rivas has a career high three field goals in the game. His career long is 47. Watch the, the hand up. No, it wasn't. He was number 66, Derek Landry. He played well earlier in the screen play that pass just a moment ago, too. 47 yards would equal his career high. Rivas puts his foot to it, and it is. Just made it over the crossbar. His fourth field goal of the game. A career long and a career high. Four field goals in one game. Michigan has to settle for another field goal after the Notre Dame turnover. They extend their lead to 12-7. Third interception thrown by Notre Dame leads to another three points by Michigan. They've gotten nine of their 12 as a result of those three interceptions. Meenberg's kickoff taken by Anastasio. And Anastasio breaks free for a moment. And then finally taken down after a pretty decent return. And the Irish take over. Now it's time for our Hall's Fruit Breezers screaming fan of the game. Like the outfit, but I don't know. And you know, you never know who might show up at Notre Dame Stadium. Oh, that's Dickie V. Both his daughters played tennis here at Notre Dame, but these got to be the winners. Yeah. Is that a yeah. chef's hat? They win both the primary. No wonder they're green. And the general election, you're right. You be a parent paying $30,000 plus up to see your kid doing it on Saturdays. <laughs> Here's Walker on the pitch, trying to sweep. Made a nice cut up. Twisted down beyond the 30-yard line to about the 31. The Irish faithful have to be happy about the way Darius Walker has come in and played in his first game. Did not play last week, and, you know, he wears number three, kind of a special number around Notre Dame. Joe Montana wore it, Rick Meyer wore it, Alice wore it. He's got 48 yards on 13 carries. You know, good ball security, too. They haven't really even come close to fumbling the ball. You can't wait to jinx him, can you? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Second down and four. Here he is trying to sweep on the other side. Powers Neal blocking, but great penetration from Marlon Jackson or Marcus Curry. And uh, Reed got into the backfield and made the shoestring tackle on Darius Walker. Marcus Curry gave up the touchdown, but boy, he has played very, very well. Remember the, the, the touchdown saving tackle he made the first half that you know, Notre Dame would have danced to the end zone and had an interception. See the four tackles and the two interceptions last week and another interception this week. So here's a third down play for the Irish. Third down and three from their own 33 yard line. They've got the I formation. Walker's the tailback. Powers Neal, the fullback. Walker, freshman, hit at the line of scrimmage, falls forward. It appears to be just a bit short. Let's see where they mark it. See that yellow line? Well, they got a pretty good spot, but just short, if you believe that yellow line. Pierre Woods made the saving tackle for Michigan. There's a guy that had a big year last year. 14 tackles for loss, seven sacks. You know, I think the right, the right decision here by Tyrone, you just give up too much field position if you go for it. Put it away, you know your defense has played sensationally, which they have. They play the little field position game right now. And again, watch out for Steve Breston, this guy, number 15. It's Patrick. Preston calls a fair catch. Fumble the football. Still loose. The Irish think they have it. And look, Tom, I think Preston tripped over one of his teammates. I don't think it was an Irish player. Ray Carr saying he did have the opportunity to catch the ball, but I think he's actually tripped over one his one guy, uh, one of his teammates. That's the, the guy who snapped it. I mean, Casey Dunn who made the recovery. Casey Dunn recovers it. Here it is. Yeah, he just trips over his own guy. So he couldn't feel the ball cleanly. And Casey Dunn, who's both snapped.
snapped the ball and then hustled down to make the recovery. Look at Coach Carr. He was hot. But as you said, it looked like a, a Michigan blocker was engaged with a Notre Dame man, and they both sort of got in his way. No call, and the first Michigan turnover. Here's Walker looking for a seam. None there. Lost the yard. Well, that, that's the perfect opportunity after a turnover like that. Yeah, for position, field position to give a little play action fake and get the ball downfield. Woods and Jackson on the stop for Michigan. You know, these long snappers, you know, they don't get a lot of a lot of credit. Oftentimes they're walk-ons as Casey Dunn was. And then you work and you work and you work. And you know, the most one of the most important people on your team. You can't get that ball back and you have to get a punt off. Ryan Grant comes in at tailback. Flag down. And a step off coming against Notre Dame. False start. Offense, 76. Five yards. The down remains second. That was Bob Morton with a false start. I'll take another look at the punt return fumble. There's the signal for the fair catch, but his right foot just trips over his teammate. Right. So he just turned him sideways. Didn't yeah. He? Never can gather the ball. A good call by the officials. No call, I should say. Second down now. Quinn being chased. Got away. Throws a dangerous pass incomplete. Intended for Fasano, I believe. Right to the sideline. Yes, it was. Okay, Brady Quinn is a, you know, is a young quarterback, a young man easy to like. I mean, he's got a lot of you know, charisma about him, got great leadership skills. And from January on, even though he was a true freshman last year, the coach said he kind of took over the leadership role of this team. And they're only going to go so, as far as they can offensively as well as he plays. And he has great, great ability if they can protect him. But hit way too many times last week and last season. Third down and 16. And a timeout has been taken by Notre Dame. Timeout Irish facing a big third and long when we come back to Notre Dame Stadium. Final minutes of the third quarter. While we we're away, the uh, band's dueling with the two best fight songs in all of college football. The victors for Michigan and the victory march for Notre Dame. It'll be about a week before those get out of my head. <laughs> big third down and long here for Notre Dame. At least want to get into field goal range. Brady Quinn, plenty of times, going for six. Stole ball. And the pass by Quinn just hung up too long and carried Stovall out of bounds. And Hall able to break it up for Michigan. Yeah, just not enough zip on that. Maybe just a little bit too much air on that. Throw that more, a little bit on a line, and you have an open Maurice Stovall for a big play. Good catch-up speed by Leon Hall. Kind of the, their third corner, but a legit corner. But Stovall was behind him. Yeah. The pass just hung up too long, and Hall was able to recover. So it means a punt. Yeah, you can't punt this ball in the end zone. This is one you're, you're playing a game of field position right now. Fitzpatrick. That's good Low punch. line drive punt. Just pooch it down. That's a good one. It'll be down to the five-yard line. Stoball down it. Great. So the Irish get the turnover, but they can't score off of it. They do have Michigan backed up deep in a 12-7 game. Presented by Lowe's. Chad Henney, the freshman quarterback, 17 of 26, 146 yards. Completed passes to seven different receivers. But they're backed up at their five-yard line. Hand off to Jackson. Jermaine Jackson, two or three tough yards. Let's go down to Lewis. All right, Tom, thanks so much. Well, at the beginning of this game, all the Notre Dame players were running out of the tunnel, and I saw the senior linebacker, Derek Curry, come onto the field with this big chain. And I said, Derek, what in the world is this all about? He said it represents one thing for our defense, unity. He said, look at the links. The links of this chain cannot be broken. And that is what the Notre Dame defense has been hanging on today, linking together, trying to stop this Michigan offense. So far, they're doing pretty well. Tom? All right, Lewis, uh, are you supposed to wear shorts after Labor Day, Pat? <laughs> oh. I knew you guys would catch me on that one. I, the shaved leg look works for Lewis. No, I didn't shave my legs, Tom. I promise you that. You know, I really think you ought to sue those legs for lack of support, Lewis. 
How about the chain? Does that go with it at all? That is. Usually there's a dog attached to a chain that large. <laughs> the dogs are out on the field, Pat. <laughs> Raylan Edwards with that reception, a yard short of the first down, third down and a yard. Yeah, but Lewis mentioned, you know, Derek Curry, a lot of good linebacker play, and Curry and Goolsby and Brandon Hoyt in particular for Notre Dame. Third down and a yard. Timeout, Michigan. I think it's a good use of a timeout. Yep. Make sure this is Absolutely. a big play. Yeah. With third down in the yard. And don't forget, NBC returns to South Bend two weeks. Saturday, September 25th, the Fighting Irish will host Washington. Washington from the Pac-10 against Notre Dame, presented by Hall's Fruit Breezers. That's Saturday, September 25th, only on NBC. We'll play Michigan State. Tyrone Willingham's alma mater next. And these uh, receivers we stopped and started at the beginning of this program with talking about the great three receivers that Michigan brought into Notre Dame Stadium today. You see what they've done, 14 receptions. That's pretty good for them, but no touchdowns. And that's what makes Kent Bear, the defensive coordinator, and Tyrone uh, Willingham very, very happy. So they've kept people in front of them, but nice day for Braylon Edwards. Ten receptions to go with his six from a week ago. Sole possession of second place all time on the Michigan receiving record book. 26 career touchdown receptions by Edwards. Now third and one for the Wolverines. Jerome Jackson in it running back. The fullback to good blocker Kevin Dudley. And he's a really good blocker, that fullback. Jackson pounding ahead for the first down. You know, we haven't seen much of Kevin Dudley today because of so many three and four wide receiver sets, but number 32 for the Michigan Wolverines, really a devastating blocker. And, uh, you know, he's been lobbying Lloyd Carr all summer long about being able to score a touchdown. Well, he got his first carry last week, right? Yeah. As Jackson uh, gets the first down. Lloyd Carr applauds the fact that the Wolverines escaped the shadow of their own goal line to keep the drive going. Approaching the 30-second mark in this third quarter. Henny, play action fake, first down pass on target and intercepted. Another play by Dwight Ellick, one of a number of players in this game, Brady, on the defensive side, who had really good games. He had a really good game because he had good speed. And we felt like that was a matchup that uh, Coach Willingham, Ken Barrow, defensive coordinator, felt comfortable with going into the game matching up versus Braylon Edwards. But you got to look at the throw. So this is Chad Henney. He was a freshman. You know, this is a big proving moment for him. The ball comes out. It's catchable, a little high. You know, and, and, and Braylon, again, as I said to, to you earlier, a lot of trash talking on that sideline. So you better believe this sparked even more momentum for us. Talked about the Goolsby tackle on him, but now after the tip, this sparked it, you know, some even more excitement and I think some momentum too on our sideline, getting us the football back, um, where, where we can now gain some confidence on offense. Last play of the third quarter, Walker with a gain. And Michigan's defense still giving you guys fits. You're gradually getting momentum, but you're winning the field position battle throughout the second half because you only made one mistake in terms of a turnover in the second half. And with the defense in the kicking game, you kept Michigan on their side of the field for most of the second half. And that was part of the key, I think. Anytime you're in a tight, contested game, you know that eventually you're going to be able to make some plays and make something happen. You know, you just got to try to win the field position battle, make it easier on yourself, limit, you know, the additional first downs you have to get and play solid, sound football. And so at this point, you know, knowing how young our offense was, when you think about guys like Maurice Stovall and Anthony Bassano and myself, John Sullivan at center, Ryan Harris, a left tackle. I mean, we were a really – Darius Walker, you know, a freshman running back. We were a young group. And so we still had some growing up to do. Our defense really helped carry us throughout this game and in large parts in this season, especially for some other big wins down the road versus like Tennessee, for example, on the road in Knoxville. It was a lot of defensive led because that was our, our older veteran kind of leadership that we had on the team that helped us along through those tough times. And as we begin the fourth quarter here, one of the uh, great things – about the offense in this game is that you did try a couple trick plays. This one didn't work. Uh, and you will try to throw it to Ryan Harris later in this drive as well. But it was the basic plays that did work, including a couple of completions you're about to make. 
to set up Darius Walker for his first career touchdown run. Yeah, again, this is what comes with the confidence that you get once you start, you know, breaking some things open. You feel like, all right, let's try something a little bit different and look at the target is Matt Shelton. We wanted to utilize that speed. He was working against Marlon Jackson, who ended up going on playing in the NFL. He was a really good cornerback at the college football level. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you have to do some of those things, too, to create a little bit of excitement, to create something on offense, to try to find a spark, especially when things are, are struggling. And this is a big play, a third down that you needed to convert. Yeah, and they brought pressure to the left side. And so the quick adjustment for us, or what we call in that point in time, is usually a side adjust, is, you know, throwing a quick slant where Murray Stovall breaks off his route. Uh, this is something that Maurice and I had a great feel for. And, and actually in my first um, start, my true freshman year, the year before, um, you know, one of my, my first big plays was an 80-yard touchdown pass to Maurice on something very similar where when I came back, I knew that there was going to be a free defender. I hit him. He took it 80 yards to the house. This is just another example of that and what we call a side adjust. Now, I will see Ryan Harris at least by the fall because he's part of our radio crew now. Does he ever mention this play to you? Yeah, yeah. He gets on me all the time about it. I mean, I, I was honestly a little bit shocked because um, he said, oh, the ball was low. And I was like, well, dude, if you just didn't drift, like you kind of kept drifting – and I'm trying to get it up over these guys. You can see me kind of laughing. And obviously, he had some words for me. But I was like, if you were a better athlete, you would have been able to catch this and, and, and take off with it. So, um, you know, not a, not a great throw on my part. Um, but, you know, if, if he – we had a diagram where he would go kind of down the sidewalk. But, again, he kind of kept drifting. And that's the hard – that's what you learn as a quarterback, especially a young one. Those big offensive linemen, when they do have their opportunity, you have to throw it just right, just perfect to give him a chance. Bill Diedrich really pulling all the stops on the plays in this game. So when you throw to a lineman and you don't complete it, you throw it again to one of the up income stars on the Notre Dame football team. Yeah. Uh, and that was kind of ended up being a little bit of a connection that Marie Stovall and I started to develop uh, Raymond McKnight as well throughout our career. Uh, Jeff Samarge, obviously everyone's kind of aware of the connection we had, but Maurice is one where uh, he was one of the easiest guys to be a teammate with. And reason being is he was always going to be where you told him to be or he was always going to communicate with you as a quarterback what he saw or where he feels like the soft spot in the defense is or if he can beat a guy and how he's going to beat a guy. He was one of my favorite all-time people in general, how hard he worked and everything else. But uh, I really felt like our relationship started to develop because I could rely on him. Okay, now you've thrown the ball four straight times. It's first and goal. Probably a good time for a run. <laughs> Well, yeah, we'd like to have a little bit of balance there. but And, th and this is just tremendous blocking by Fasano, by Marcus Freeman on the edge, as well as our right tackle, Mark Lavore, uh, helping to seal and making it just a, a straight path. And, and you, I mean, we talked about momentum earlier with the Goolsby hit and then our offense sparking with a big play. Th this was like the beginning of like kind of almost like a, an avalanche. You know, we really feel like we had them on their heels. It's the fourth quarter. They're in our house. Uh, we could build off of this momentum. And for Darius, as I talked about before, with you know, he looks so slow in practice. We're like, what's this going to look like in the game? He got off in the game, man, and he, took, and, and he was a gamer. He started you know, doing his thing. And, and there's going to be another run he has here later on. Uh, well, I'll never forget uh, him basically forcing a defender to lose his jockstrap. We're going to see that very shortly. And I think another thing that was a big boost is, and it was a big topic of conversation after the BYU game, highly touted recruit, Never got in the BYU game. Both for teammates and just fans, there's Darius. Here's a weapon we thought we had, and now we know we have it. Yeah, and I think it was tough because you, you had a guy like Ryan Grant. And Ryan was a very successful running back throughout the course of his time at Notre Dame. Obviously went on to win a Super Bowl in the NFL. And with BYU's defensive structure, they ran a 3-3-5. It's really difficult to prepare for. And, and like I said earlier, Maybe one of the reasons why we had overlooked BYU a little bit from a scheme perspective was we were so fixated on Michigan and that top 10 matchup that we didn't necessarily feel as prepared for a lot of the blitzes and things they brought. And I think one of the reasons in that game where maybe we were concerned about putting Darius in was the concern of if he could handle the responsibility with, with the pass protection at the running back spot. Folks, you are discovering why Brady is doing so well now in his new career as a football analyst. We'll be back in just a moment, but right now we're going to send it back to Tom and Pat. Tom, I think they're out of the funnel, the offensive funnel. And they have a lead. 
I'm still surprised they didn't go for two to try to make yeah. a three point ball game. I am. Joy, you're ready to kick off to Mason and Breston. This is Breston at the five. And Breston breaks the tackle and powers ahead to the 36 yard line. Good return by Steve Breston. Hey, Tom, well, let's take a look at and why that play was so successful. It was, you know, you got two guys on this right side, these two tight ends, number 88 and 87, Marcus Freeman. Then really seal block that outside. There's number 88, Fasano, 87 right there, Freeman, 73 right there, Mark Lavore. And then it's just a race to the uh, to the end zone, and Darius Walker's going to win most of those. Well designed, beautifully executed one. Raymond McKnight was getting a block in the end zone, too. And uh, so the Irish have a lead for the first time since November 29, 2003, against Stanford over 166 minutes. You were incredible picking those things up, Tom. I don't keep track of everything like that. I had to use all fingers and toes to count that one up. Nice run there by Jerome Jackson on first down. And, you know, Tom, for, for Chad Henney, his first time that he's he's behind in a college football game. You know, how, how does a guy like this respond? Jackson got about three yards on first down. And it looked like it was going to be a stop for no game. Gould's be made the tackle. It's second down at seven. I don't think Chad Henney appears, at least from my seat, to have a lot of huddle presence. Second down seven from their own 38. Play action fake. Henny. It's a no-hitter and allows Derek Curry to make a big, big sack and put Chad Henney in a third and 19 with his team down by two. And a look at Curry, who had to come out of the game. A draw play to Rembert. Zivakowski first to hit him. Goolsby there, too. Boy, it is tough to win on the road in college football. Lloyd Carr has known that. He lost the last four openers on the road. And he's got a very, very excited Irish team right now that leads by two. And they were wary, uh, despite the Irish loss at BYU last week. Michigan expected this kind of game. Yeah, in a 38 nothing game last year. And Tyrell Willingham said to us yesterday, he, he never wants to forget that feeling, or his team to forget that feeling, of losing 38 to nothing. Blocked! Blocked! Scooped up! No! And Brady, huge special teams play and a very aggressive call to go for the punk block in that situation. Well, again, we, we felt like we had the momentum. And if you look at the play itself, we had an overload rush on that side. Chase Anastasio, again, a part of our class from Virginia. There must be something in the water in Virginia. Those guys are always blazing fast. But him, Jerome Collins, Corey Mays, a lot of athleticism, a lot of power, just got great push. And I believe Jerome actually got his hands in on the football. Uh, and then, obviously, Corey there to, to pick it up and put us in great field position. But, you know, this is the sort of thing that starts to happen when you feel that momentum in college football. You're playing at home. The fans are behind you. You get that lead in the fourth quarter. Now it's time to be aggressive and close some things out. Collins with the actual block, and Corey Mays, well coached, just fell on the football, and it didn't take long for you guys to get in in the end zone. No, uh, thankful to Darius Walker here, uh, but the block into Dan Stevenson, nice seal on the edge, Marie Stovall coming down on the safety. But I wish we could go back and look at that just one more time. The move that Darius made on the defender on the edge, after I handed the football off, when I peeked back and looked, uh, it almost looked like the guy like got his foot stuck in the grass and like his ankle broke. It was unbelievable. I mean, he literally froze the defender and then just took off like it was nothing. And it was so subtle, but it was dangerous. Like, like that, that, that person, that, that guy's parents are probably at home right now, you know, calling the team doctor to make sure his ankles are all right. But uh, this was the beginning of just a tremendous career for Darius. And what a time to have such a breakout game. Well, and what a great way to, 
to begin your college career. He's now had touchdown runs against Michigan on consecutive carries. He ends up carrying the ball 31 times in this game. Now, going in, as you see, Darius, as all players should, reminding his mom that he loves her, uh, was that the game plan? Did you expect Darius, as we take another look at the pump block, to get the ball that much in this game? We knew he was going to receive an increased load. Um, didn't necessarily know how much. I think the game was going to dictate part of that. Um, but we knew he was going to play more in this game. You got a sense of that throughout the course of week in practice. And that's why I kind of go back to just how he was as a practice player. There were a lot of us who were kind of curious to see how it was going to be just because he didn't practice at the same speed at which he played in the game. Uh, and that's why you've got that kind of term that you hear from guys, you know, guys being a gamer. And there's no doubt Darius was that. Well, folks, now the offense has got it going. The defense never let up in this game. So the next time that Brady Quinn and I rejoin you, it will be to talk about another big Notre Dame defensive play. Of Notre Dame, a personal foul, which is assessed on the kickoff, which means the kickoff by Joya will come from the 20-yard line. So Mason and Breston await the kick, standing this time around their own 15-yard line. Joya's kick to Mason at the 20, 19. And hit hard. The Irish inspired now, experiencing some success for a change, and Nick Borset delivered a blow to Mason to stop him after he had gained a couple of yards. You know, I think there's nothing more devastating emotionally for a team than a blocked punt. And, and right now, Michigan is really, really A year ago, they had a senior, John Navarre, to settle him down. See what kind of uh, drive Chad Henney the first week he put together. Michigan has been playing virtually the entire game without David Underwood, their top running back, who was injured in the first quarter. Henney's pass. Deflected incomplete by Greg Pauley. Remember what Ken Bear said to us yesterday? He said, I'm really happy with my inside guys. And D Derek Landry's tipped the ball. Greg Pauley's now tipped the ball. Trevor Laws has played well. Justin Tuck, that man, number 44, has put a lot of pressure on the quarterback. And he also said that uh, I feel good about this game. I feel yeah. that we're going to play well. Well, remember yesterday he, he was watching for the 15th time of the 2002 Michigan uh, Notre Dame game. And what was he said this week in practice? He saw his linebackers at practice and says, I don't know if we're tough enough. <laughs> that got him fired uh, up. <laughs> he played great. He knew exactly what he was doing when he said that to me. Here's Henny throwing underneath and another great tackle. This one by Preston Jackson on Braylon Edwards. And Preston Jackson had, oh, a, me, on Preston. Uh, had a 30 yard touchdown interce interception for a touchdown last week, but boy, is he tackled well today. Three deflections, five knockdowns, a sack. Third down. Henny steps up, his pass deflected. Incomplete, Preston Jackson again makes the play, this time on Tyler Ecker. The, the combination of Justin Tuck's pass rush and a brilliant play by Preston Jackson forces another punt. And that's when you can have it really going on def defense. When you put the pressure on the quarterback right down here, and see, so he just couldn't follow through. It wasn't allowed him to be accurate as he normally is. And then Preston Jackson makes a great knockdown. Good pass rush always makes good corners. Finley had his last punt blocked. Carlisle Holiday awaits it. Here's Espazio down here to block the last one. Return on this time, and a good boot by Finley. Chases Holiday back almost to the 15. And he won't get much farther than that. Sure tackle downfield by Hood. Darrell Hood limited Holiday to a six-yard return after Finley boomed it 54 yards. Play of the game. And it's the block punt. The Irish recovered it and punched it in for a touchdown. I was going to have a punter on my team. He's, he got so many punts blocked. His nickname was Double Thud. <laughs> unexpected play of the game brought to you by the document company Xerox, helping your company grow in unexpected ways. Irish take over. Flag is down. 
Darius Walker can't turn the corner this time. Ernest Shazer made sure of that. It's a pretty impressive freshman play. We've talked about Henny a lot. Obviously, Darius Walker getting his first taste of college football, and boy, he has emerged, hasn't he? 19 carries and 65 yards, two touchdowns. Offside, defense, 96, five yards, repeat first down. Larry Harrison whistled for offside. You know, nine-point ball game at home, I think this is where offensive lines can, can really take control of the game. And then we said earlier, this offensive line has a chance to be pretty good. Four returning starters, a new guy in John Sullivan, who they think is going to be a very good center. It was but kind he, of a mystery why they weren't better, huh? Absolutely. But you know, kind of grinding out, just kind of hanging on the ball and grinding out some first downs, you know, uh, taking some time off the clock, punt it away, force mission to go the, a long way. Walker. Up. He almost had a huge game. Again, the tight ends, Freeman and Fasano doing a good job blocking to spray Walker for a first down. And Lawrence Reed makes a touchdown saving tackle, perhaps. You know, these those tight ends, both of them caught seven passes last week, but really they give all of those up for the way they're blocking right now. I mean, they've done a great job springing Darius Walker for those two touchdowns, and they're for the first down right now. That's Lawrence Reed, I think it was Lawrence Reed, number 42, just gets his left and you talk about a shoestring track, well, that actually is a shoestring right, right track. Uh, shoestring. Shoestring. Yeah, it was shoestring. <laughs> Here's Walker again. Nice cutback. Fumbles the football. You know, I think Dan Stevenson recovered it. Wow, what a hustling play by Stevenson. If, in fact, he did, and he did. Dan Stevenson or John Sullivan, they're all down there trying to get it. I think I saw a four on the ball. Yeah. Let's see. Ball comes out. And again, we talked about the freshman running backs and ball security. What a big opportunity. You're right. It was 78. John Sullivan. Freshman. Actually, freshman eligibility. He's a sophomore from Old Greenwich. That's that water polo. Uh, uh, rugby, rugby. You know, rugby play. <laughs> or rugby, right. Yeah. So the Irish lucky on that one as they recover the fumble. Giving him a first down at the 47. What does the coach do? They bring in the other running. As soon as, as, soon as the freshman fumbles, you yeah. bring in Ryan Grant. Grant the tailback. Make it to him. Quinn's pass. Mm. Too low for Fasano. Oh. What, what a nice play call and an easy throw. Sometimes the most difficult throw is when you have that wide receiver or tight end wide open. But Quinn has made it several of those today, hasn't yeah. he? Yeah. Just didn't look like he might get his feet set. Well, of course, he's getting something in his face. But that's, you know, that keeps the drive alive. That would have been a first down. 8 of 18 for the sophomore Quinn. This time becomes a factor. Each team has two timeouts remaining. Coming to the nine-minute mark. Stops on that incomplete pass at 9.09. .09. And Darius Walker back in at tailback. Give it to him. And Walker bounces to the outside. Right out of bounds after picking up a first down by Ryan Mundy. Another good block from Fasano. Gain of 12. Anthony Fasano. I, Darius Walker's only a freshman. But maybe you ought to take Anthony Fasano out for an ice cream cone or something after the game. Or maybe two. You look at the size of that guy. <laughs> exactly. He's going to need more than one. But Fasano right smack in the middle of this hole. 88. Number 88. Just going to get right into the linebacker, Lawrence Reed. And then Walker makes a man miss. The arm tackle won't bring him down. Monday finally gets him and pushes him out of bounds. Tyrone was right. He does see things. He's gained uh, 84 yards, Pat, averaging four yards a carry. Here's another carry. Cut back. A nice cut back. And he's inside the 35-yard line, tackled by Sean Craven. Ask for, he's a little winded, asking for... <laughs> Asking for a breather as Marcus Wilson comes in. You know, Tom, the Irish faithful have been waiting for the West Coast offense to arrive, and I, and I think it has. They it came, can't keep this up. Came out of Georgia, looks like today, in the form of Darius Walker. Good point. Very good point. 46 rushing touchdowns last year in high school. And Tyrone Will Willingham talked to us yesterday about the West Coast offense, and he said, you know, it's just kind of an extension of the running game. We have not been able to do it, but I have every confidence that we will get there. In trouble, decides to tuck it under and fumbles the ball. And this time, Michigan has it. Michigan.
Michigan with its fourth turnover. Michigan causes its fourth turnover of the game. This one a fumble by Brady Quinn, recovered by Prescott Burgess. You know, you just, because quarterbacks, I don't think you just ever get hit much in practice. You, you talk about ball security for running backs and wide receivers, but sometimes he gets away from quarterbacks because they just don't get hit much in practice. Missed a lot of throws. Eight of 18, three interceptions. Still can't tell him passing yards. Eight of 18. So I guess I should go down here. One forty-three. the ball to Michigan, the fourth Irish turnover of the day, 21-12 Notre Dame. You know, and Michigan needs two scores to win this thing with 8-10 remaining. I, I think they should be in a hurry up, Tom. They haven't had much offense in the second half, only about 50 yards. That one. Tell you what, Brady, what a great individual effort by Dwight Ellick. Not only does he step up to make the stop on the pass, he strips the ball and then falls on it. No, it was an incredible play and, and great game for Dwight. We talked about him matching up versus Brennan at times. Jason Avant's another guy that went on to play 11 years in the NFL. I mean, this was an incredibly talented Michigan team. And again, a reason why they're so highly ranked coming into it. Uh, and I think the biggest thing for me was I just fumbled, you know, I was trying to make a play, switching the football in my arms, the, the ball got stripped out. And after I've gotten the lead at home, the fourth quarter, probably pressing and trying to do a little bit too much. This was one of those moments where, you know, when I came off the field, the defense was like, we got your back. And, and I think that's one of the biggest, you know, votes of confidence that you could have as a player. And as we saw in the replay after that play, I don't think I've ever seen that much emotion from Tyrone Willingham ever. I bet when he gets a hole in one, he doesn't jump that high. <laughs> I don't know about that. He's a pretty avid golfer, but uh, no, he, he understood exactly what that meant. It really erased the mistake that I had made. And now you're clean again. Now you're controlling the clock. You're in plus territory. You have all those things working for you as you try to go and kind of continue to create separation. And look, he, he understood the pressure, especially after we lost out in Provo, uh, Provo, Utah. He understood how badly we needed to win this game. Well, I mean, he talks about it in the post-game interview that you'll see at the end of this broadcast. And when Notre Dame doesn't win games that people think they're supposed to win, the number one target not necessarily the quarterback, it's the head coach. So Tyrone was well aware of the targets that were on him and how important it was to turn it around and how meaningful it was. When you beat the number eight team in the country, that is tangible evidence that you've got a pretty talented football team that is playing well. At this point in time, you know, Michigan and Notre Dame were battling for that, you know, all-time wins, all-time winning percentage. You know, that was things that were discussed before this game. Uh, now, granted, I mean, in retrospect, you know, you, you can't put the entire weight of history on your shoulders. It's just one game, so you really need to focus on that. But this was where, uh, again, we started to try to take some shots, make some big plays, and try to build off of the momentum of the Dwight Ellick fumble recovery or, you know, strip fumble and recovery. This was a huge play, and Raymond McKnight goes up and makes a heck of a catch. I mean, the names, you had some pretty good receivers to throw the ball to. No, I did, and I think one of the things – is, you know, you had to understand the, the type of guys you were throwing through. There, there wasn't going to be great separation, so you had to put the ball high to the outside where they could elevate and make the play. And I believe that was Curry for Michigan. And that, and that was who we picked on previously for a touchdown pass with Shelton. It, we weren't going to test Marlon Jackson. You know, he kind of got that, that treatment where, like, Darrell Revis, we played him the next year. You just don't really throw his way. You, you work on the other guys where you feel like you have a more favorable matchup, and that's what we did. Darius Walker trying to go for his third touchdown here. He will not get it, 
but uh, then we will see something that is a staple of the West Coast offense, and that's throwing the football to the fullback. <laughs> that's right. We had one who was, uh, had some really good hands, Rashawn Powers Neal, uh, one in particular. He was, he was a great blocker, uh, but also a, a really good target out of the backfield. And as much as we had been running the football with our two tight end sets and then our 21 personnel with, with our fullback sets, we felt like, again, this is an opportunity where we could get him out in some space and he'd be able to do the rest. So we'll let that play roll here. And he was wide open. Yeah, and that's what happens. You know, the, the guy who's going to be responsible for him when teams play a lot of that post-high safety defense, one safety in the middle of the field, everyone's down around the line of scrimmage, a lot of times man-to-man, -man, the guy responsible for covering him is in the middle. It's a middle linebacker. So he's got to run up through all that traffic to be able to cover him and that's where, when they're thinking it's a run initially, he only has to be one or two steps behind to get caught up. And then, you know, you got your fullback running free to the flat. And obviously, Coach Diedrich making an easy call for me, it being a rollout, uh, helped him make an easy pitch and catch. And you were very good rolling out, throwing the football in both directions, not just to your strong side. Yeah, it was something that we worked on. You know, I, I remember having a conversation with Ty Willingham when I was coming to Notre Dame. And he said, this is the West Coast offense. You know, we don't want to just prohibit you from – um, you know, going to one side of that. We want you to be versatile, be able to, you know, roll to your left, roll to your right, do a bunch of different things. We want to utilize that athleticism. So th this was, in this case, uh, a staple of really what we were trying to do offensively. So a terrific second half offensive performance. Darius Walker becomes the first Notre Dame freshman to run for a, a hundred yards in five years. Julius Jones was the last to do it. Walker ended up with 115 yards on 31 carries and you end up putting 28 points on Michigan in the second half. Which was huge for us, uh, all things considered with the way the first half went and really just kind of licking some of our wounds coming off of the loss to BYU. Um, you know, we knew how big this game was to us going back to the conversation of what happened the year before. Everything was about beating Michigan. It was ingrained in our heads. And, and this rivalry meant so much uh, because of the date, September 11th, because of the rivalry, for me personally, my first chance to start against Michigan. Um, didn't play my best game, but we got the win, and that was all that matters, or all that mattered to me, looking across the sidelines uh, at Lloyd Carr, at Scott Leffler, a lot of the guys who had recruited me, Jim Herman in particular, who was on the defensive side of the ball, but he was our area recruiter there in Columbus, Ohio. So uh, it meant the world to me to be able to find a way of just winning this one. So as you can see, folks, 545 remaining in this game, and I don't care who the coach is, at some point in time during their careers, they're criticized for clock management in a game like this. Clock management is going to be important. Michigan's going to score here again, but Notre Dame's going to do a pretty good job of clock management. And when all is said and done, this game is in the books. Brady and I will come back to wrap up tonight's Game Watch. The biggest play of the game, the block punt by Notre Dame. And then over the again, once more, Dwight Ellis seizing the ball from the receiver of in this ballgame. And I've seen more emotion out of Ty Willingham yes. today than I've seen in three years. In, absolutely. You know, I think his players like that. I think they, they, they feed up. And his pass is low, incomplete, intended for Breston. The Michigan offense completely shut down in the second half by the Irish defense. And given that advantage, the Irish offense has suddenly come alive after dormancy for a season and a game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, out of the doldrums now. And their defense, Notre Dame's defense, is going to give their offense a lot of chances this season to keep playing like this. Henny with good protection. His pass, though, over the head of Jason Avant, who was defended by Dwight Ellick. Stops the clock, 5.33 left. Well, Lloyd Carr knows how tough those openers on the road are, and he knows how tough Notre Dame Stadium is. Michigan had a, has had a tie, but hasn't won here since, what, 1994? Post ball game when he was here two, two years ago, 25-23. Decided late in the game. Under pressure, hit. 
gets the sack, but Victor Abiyamiri, number 95, should get a lot of credit. As he forced Chad Haney to hold on to the ball, allows Justin Tuck to come to the backside. Two really good pass rushing ends. Abiyamiri right here really forces him to duck, and that allows Tuck, number 44, to clean it up. And clean it up he did. So Finley is on for another punt. Well, the decision to go for the block punt a while back, I thought was really, really good because Notre Dame really had Michigan on their heels. Short punt taken by Carlisle Holiday. And Holiday takes it all the way back to the 42-yard line. That's been a good move for the Irish today, too, putting Holiday back returning punts. Had one big gainer nullified by a penalty. Things looking good for the Irish. Team of the nation. Trailing Notre Dame 28-12 after they were up 9-0 at halftime. Notre Dame's ball beginning at the 42 of Michigan. The offensive star of the game for the Irish. Darius Walker, the freshman running back, getting his feet wet today and coming through. In fine fashion for the Irish, Lamar Woodley makes that stop. Walker is the first Notre Dame freshman to rush for 100 yards since Julius Jones had 146 against Navy back in 1999. Well, if he can emulate Julius Jones, it's going to be a pretty good Notre Dame career. Julius rushing for over 1,200 yards last year. And I tell you, they get him in the open field for some big runs and his wide receivers beginning to develop. You know, they have a chance of really developing a pretty good offense. Play clock ticking down. They want to use as much of it as they can before handing it again to Walker. Trying to push his blockers out of his way. He made a nice cut back again, Gabriel Watson. You know, Tom, to me, watching Tyrone Willingham get excited as we've seen it a couple times today. We, we haven't seen it a lot. Even in that 10-win season, you didn't see this kind of emotion. And I just kind of sense his young players love to see that out of the head coach. And a high five to Sean Powers Neal. That's a very different demeanor for Tyrone Willingham. Michigan has taken a timeout. They have one timeout left with 3.53 on the clock. The Ryder Cup's coming up. The Ryder Cup will yeah. be uh, in Michigan. And Tyrone Willingham was being considered for a spot on the team. Look at him getting ready for the Ryder Cup. Let's look at his form. Would he be selected? Well, it looks good for him, but not quite. Not no. quite good enough to make the Ryder Cup team. But I'm sure he'll be interested in the result. And if you are, too, we assume you are. One of the great golfing events. The Ryder Cup begins on USA next week and then winds up Saturday and Sunday on NBC. Great, great golf track. Oakland Hills South. Starts Friday at 8 a.m. Eastern and Pacific on USA, and then Saturday and Sunday on NBC. All the coverage of the Ryder Cup. You can tell anybody in my, in my office how I'm watching Friday morning. I go late. <laughs> I promise. I bet you'll be found out. Well, you know, Tyrell Willingham, we saw him yesterday. We asked him how you're doing. He said, it's about as good as you can for a guy in my position. If he can hang on to win. He's going to really exhale this afternoon. In fact, that's what he said next. He said, you know, a win would cure everything. I don't know if it'll cure everything, but well, it'll go a, a long way. But uh, against a worthy opponent. Yeah. You know, the eighth-ranked Michigan Wolverines, a team that won 10 games a year ago, that won the Big Ten. And you know, all since that 38 nothing blanking by Michigan last year, the coaches didn't want the players to forget that. They said in these workouts, do 38 reps. They were always reminded of the number 38. And we asked Tyrone about that, too, and he said, I didn't want them to ever forget it. And said, not just as it relates to Michigan, but as it relates to the class football programs that we have played, because we haven't played well against the big names. Look at the day they have. And here's what's coming up for the Irish. They go to East Lansing. You know what part of uh, Michigan that's in? Uh, East Lansing. We go to Lansing, yeah. then you go due east, I think. Yeah. I had to pay you back. Yeah. Washington. <laughs> and then Purdue looks like they're a pretty good uh, ball club. And an uh, improved Stanford team. We'll have all three of those games, of course, on NBC. And hats off to, uh, to Kent Bear and the defense of the Irish. And uh, I have to say that uh, as we talked to him yesterday, Coach Bear was... Uh, he looks hard. <laughs> yeah, but he but he seemed pretty confident. And uh, Lloyd Carr, he was he knew that 
There's Kent Bear. And Michigan knew they were going to have the battle. Kent Bear was saying to us, you know, after BYU, they arrived at, what, 6.15 in the morning, went home, showered, came back to the office, was there until midnight Sunday night. Along with the rest of the staff. On fourth down. Patrick with another pooch punt. Preston will let it bounce into the end zone for a touchback. You know, Casey Dunn, who made that long snap right there, is a guy that made recovery early in the game, but he has snapped well in punt formation. One of those uh, talents that coaches really appreciate. The Michigan offense this first half, or this second half, has not been particularly good. Here's how good they have not been. Okay. That's Eight possessions, 27 plays. One first down, three points. Plus a lost fumble, an interception, and a block punt. I mean, some of that's awfully good defense by the Irish. Wouldn't you admit Dwight Alec has played great? And, and they've been without that man Underwood for virtually the entire game. They're a top rusher. Injured in the first quarter. And he's pass. Complete to Avant. Tackled by Carlos Campbell. You know, so much of football, I think, is a game of confidence, and, and maybe Notre Dame was a little staggered last week after the BYU loss, but I think a win at home against a quality opponent has got to give this team great confidence. And as they go on the road to Michigan State, they're going to feel a lot better about themselves than they did last summer. Dudley gets a carry, only his second of the season. You know, uh, if, the fan, if the players weren't staggered by the loss to BYU, the fans certainly were. Notre Dame... Last three wins against top ten teams. 1998 against number five, Michigan. 2002 against number seven, Michigan. As Braylon Edwards takes it down. Out of bounds. Run out by Preston Jackson after the big game of 27 yards. Well, Preston Jackson has had a really good game. We talked about Dwight Ellick, but Preston Jackson, number 15, has played very well for the yards. A very good tackle. A hustling play ran about 40 yards to make that tackle on Braylon Edwards. Becoming a factor. Almost three minutes. Penny on first down. Steps up. Finds his fullback Dudley. <laughs> Dudley just a yard short of a first down. Tackled by Goolsby and Curry. Let's go to Lewis. Well, Tom, if you look out on the field, you look at Michigan player number one, Braylon Edwards, their wide receiver. You know he had a chance to jump to the NFL after last season, but he chose to come back, he told me, because of a sour taste in his mouth. The big one was, of course, the loss to USC in the Rose Bowl last year, but he said he also had a sour taste in his mouth from the loss that they'd suffered two years ago against Notre Dame, 25-23, and Braylon telling me before the game that being in Notre Dame Stadium today was one of the reasons he chose to return. But it looks like at this moment, with 2.41 left on the clock, he'll have to leave here with that sour taste still in his mouth. Tom? Clock stopped at 2.41 after the incomplete pass from Chad Henney. Henney with a handoff. Should have got out of bounds there, right? Rembert. Did not get out of bounds. Clock continues to roll after it, well, after it stops for the right. first down. Hit change movement. But you know who's probably the happiest about the emergence? Darius Walker as a rusher for the Notre Dame. The defense. The defense. You know, it gives them a little hope, too, that their offense can score some points. Derek Curry shaking up. So the clock will remain stopped. Stopped for the first down and then is restarted when the ball's ready for play. Still stopped as Curry has tended to. Well, you know, we talked to Tyrone Willingham yesterday about, you know, his offensive struggles. and but th This is the guy that has won in the Pac-10, beat all the big teams in the Pac-10, running his West Coast offense, was two times Pac-10 coach of the year, four bowl games, including a Rose Bowl game. And uh, this could be a watershed game for his team. But they'll have to uh, go on the road next week at Michigan State and prove that uh, this home victory was no good. 
you know, the, Michigan State has struggled as well while losing to Rutgers uh, last week. Excuse me, Tom. You, you, know, you also see why coaches want to play seven games at home now. Notre Dame plays six, but, you know, it's just so hard to win on the road. And when you play the schedule that they do, some teams playing not only seven games at home, eight. Clock will start when the ball is marked ready for play. And Michigan's up on the line ready to go. Chad Henney looking to the end zone. Wide open. Touchdown. Steve Breston. on the score on the pass from Chad Henney. They need to go for two here. They have to go for two to make it an eight-point game to give themselves a chance. So Chad Henney, for one thing, he has got an a, a arm. Doesn't he a strong arm? They throw a greasy pork chop past the hungry wolf, oh, no, as they no, said. No, no. Look at Preston. Look at the fan wearing number 15. Yeah. Preston score. Two-point play to make it a, a, a uh, eight-point game. Preston was wide open on that touchdown reception. And now the Wolverines go for two. Henny rolls. Delivers. Caught. Preston for the two-point conversion. Well, Dwight Ellick almost kept him out. But Steve Preston. And Lloyd Carr trying to rally the Wolverines as Preston with a touchdown reception and a two-point conversion reception pulls the Wolverines with an eight. Yeah, 227 left. Absolutely. Good good call. It, it, it turned up a little bit late and almost knocked out of the uh, on the sideline by Dwight Ellick. The official right on the spot hit the pylon into the end zone. That's a two-point play. Lloyd Carr getting his team fired up. Now he's going to make the decision, do I, do I tr attempt the onside kick? Well, 227 left. He's got no timeouts remaining. Chad Henney now 24-39, 230 yards. That was his first touchdown pass. He has thrown an interception. You know, I, I think if you had a few timeouts, maybe you kick it away and try to play defense. I think with no timeouts, Michigan has none. I think you have to attempt it. That's the timeout situation. And the clock shows 227. And in college football... And see, see the way he's teeing it up there, yeah, Pat. It's going to be a, it's definitely going to be an onside kick. What you're trying to do is get that real high bounce. He's recovered about 10% of the time. And this is Rivas, not Neenberg. So there's the onside attempt. And covered by Notre Dame. Maurice Stovall on the hands team. He collars it. He's had some hands today, hasn't he? He's had that breakout game. for two players, Maurice Stovall and the freshman Darius Walker. Here's Walker, his first collegiate touchdown. And he wasn't finished yet. 28 carries, 109 yards, and two touchdowns for the freshman. And he's got some make you miss him. He does, and he nearly broke free there. Quick starts, too. Then the Darius Walker just gets started so quickly. His eyes are always looking downfield. And Pat, we said the other breakout game where he stove all five catches, 82 yards yeah. a day, and it was the way he did it, too. Yeah, absolutely. Went over some people and made some adjustments to the ball in the air. Kind of settled down. Remember that one sight adjustment where we saw the blitz? It was a smart play by Maurice Stovall as well. Michigan cannot stop the clock, which is inside two minutes. Inside the 40, tackled by Lamar Woodley. You know, Tom, Tyrone had some big wins in his first season here when he did win 10 games, but after the way last season went, I don't think he's had a more significant win than this one today. And it is a, isn't it interesting that if this one holds up for the Irish, that their last three victories against top 10 teams will all have been Michigan. Third down. Walker. 
cuts up inside the 40, short of the first down. Scott McClintock makes the tackle. Well, I think with the new, use the full 25 second clock, take the penalty, then punt the ball away. Right, right? exactly. Use the, all the 25 seconds. They haven't marked it for quite in, so it's going to be down to about 20 seconds when the penalty goes off. They're actually going to use a timeout. Play clock gets down to about two, is what you want to call it. The quarterback tells the referee. Tells him, I'm going to call a timeout. Stands next to him, usually, as he is right there. There he calls it with one second left. Well managed. And the Wolverines, only 20 seconds left to try to pull one out. Here's what they face coming up. They play San Diego State. Good defensive team, San Diego State. Then uh, start Big Ten play against Iowa, Indiana, and Minnesota. Defending Big Ten champs. But I'll tell you, right, right now, Notre Dame's going to try to punt this ball. What do you think Tyrone will try to punt this for 20 seconds remaining? He could just run around and let some time expire. What do you think? I think he go ahead and try to punt it. Well, you don't want to get a block. Yeah, and Michigan will absolutely be coming after him. It's hard to run out 20 seconds. You know, he kind of right. run around. So I think right. he probably has to punt it. And, you know, Casey Dunn, number 64, the long snapper. Boy, what a what a nice job he has done all day in a bright weather. But this is the biggest snap of the day for Casey. Fitzpatrick is the punter. Michigan's going to come after him. Snap, a little low, but Fitzpatrick boots it away with no problem. Reston's going to let it bounce into the end zone. Batted back out. It didn't break the plane. Oh, they're going to mark it inside the five-yard line. It's the ball that counts. No matter where the players are, if the ball does not break the play of the end zone. That's a good, it's a really good special team. First, to get this ball off. And D.J. Fitzpatrick does a nice job of recovering a low snap. And look, that's all he wanted. Carlos Campbell bats it to Stovall. And as you said, even if he is in the end zone, that doesn't make a difference. If the ball is outside. Right, the ball has to break the plane. And now they say it did, I guess, because they're bringing it out to the 20. Okay. But the rule is different from the NFL rule. It's the ball that counts, not the player. Nine seconds remaining, and it's very, very tough to throw a Hail Mary pass against Notre Dame. Nine That's seconds left, man. Yeah. Chad Henney slipped, regained his feet, and fired a strike. Edwards faked a toss, and then was wrapped up in the 30. for the embattled Tyrone Willingham. So, Brady, you've had a lot of highs in your career, but take us back to this game. What did it mean to the young sophomore quarterback, Brady Quinn, to lead the Irish with the help of the defense to a victory over Michigan? Not even the help of the defense. We saw the special teams play, too, by Jerome Collins and, and Corey Mays and Chase Anastasia getting in there. Um, it, it was big for me, I think, because – I hadn't quite, you know, gotten to the point where I was solidified as the guy. You know, I was still trying to make that claim. And I didn't play my best game, but I responded. And the biggest thing was is um, my teammates had my back. The coaching staff had my back. They believed in me. They supported me. Uh, and they played, you know, really well around me. And that, so that allowed me to have the confidence that, hey, I don't have to go out there and be perfect. You know, I was, I was one of those guys where I think my biggest – uh, mistakes or issue was always trying to be perfect with my reads and whatever I was doing and with the ball placement and everything else. And sometimes I'd allow that to get to me. Um, this was a moment where like, I think I was able to realize like, man, I don't have to be perfect to go out there and win football games. Uh, I just have to be able to, you know, rely on these guys, let them do their thing and they'll go make plays for you. And they're, they're going to go help you out. Obviously a lot of young talent offensively on this Notre Dame football team. You had the coaching change after the year. The next year, you just explode. The offense just explodes. I mean, Jeff Samarja was on this team as well, and you really didn't even see him much 
in this game, but talk about how the rest of your sophomore year, how you think you improved to set the stage to take advantage of everybody else growing alongside you and a new offensive scheme that really fit that collection of players the following year. Yeah, I think the, the rest of the year, you know, we had some big wins. I mean, we, we beat a Tennessee team in Knoxville. It felt like a night game. I think it began at 3 or 4 o'clock. But by, by the time we got into the third, fourth quarter, it was dark there. And th that place was rowdy. That was probably the loudest place we've ever been. And, again, a, a strong defensive performance in that game to help get us there. I think our offense did enough um, to be able to get a win. But, you know, we beat some, some, some of the teams that people didn't think we could beat. And then we lost some teams that we probably should have beat, had leads should have beat BC, should have beat Pitt. Uh, and so it, it didn't work out that way. But, but I think there was moments in time in that sophomore year where we kind of were galvanized because of some of the adversity. And, and then there were periods of time where we were, you could see our display of how well uh, we were able to perform. I think the Washington game was one in particular that kind of sticks out. So um, the, that kind of prepared us for that next year, you know, that maturation process in when Charlie got there. And I think the biggest thing Charlie did was really – equip me and, and, and anoint me not only as the guy but equip me with all the tools to kind of control and run everything so if he made a call and and maybe we could get into something better i had the opportunity to do that and and then he put guys in position where he understood what raymond mcknight did well or marie stovall did well uh, or jeff samarja did well and, and how to put them in positions where they could go out and they could ball and they could succeed so offensively i think we we really um you know kind of hit that that growth curve over the rest of the season and into the next year where we started to take off offensively. There is a characteristic of just about every Notre Dame athlete, and I can extend this to every Notre Dame student. Maybe it's part of the characteristics that attract you to Notre Dame. Maybe it's something Notre Dame searches for. But when you leave here, everybody who is associated with Notre Dame tries to help the communities in which they live. And you excel at this. So anytime that I have a chance to chat with you and you're generous enough to give us some of your time. I want you to update us on where the third and goal foundation is and some upcoming events. People can help you with the very uh, high level goals to help veterans of your foundation. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, Jack. Um, it is part of the fabric of a lot of the guys that come to Notre Dame and the students that are there and what they do once they leave. It's trying to find a way of giving back and helping to improve the world. Uh, for me, it was helping out our veterans. You know, this idea dawned on me uh, when I left Notre Dame. I was with the Denver Broncos at this time in 2010, and I'd met a couple of wounded warriors. And I just asked them, you know, hey, what could I do to help you or help you with your transition from active duty now into civilian life? And after that conversation, I went home, called my dad, who was a former Marine who fought in Vietnam. His father fought in WW2 in the Army. So we had deep ties already and obviously a profound respect for um, the military, all, you know, all the academies, having played them in Notre Dame, understanding that the you know, mantra, God, country, Notre Dame, all those things kind of fit in line with a lot of my ideals and beliefs. And so my dad was, it was a home builder. And he said, why don't we start, you know, maybe remodeling some homes to make them handicap accessible for some wounded vets. And let's start off with one. Uh, I self-funded it and I continued to do so until we decided to have a golf outing uh, called the Blue Jacket Golf Outing. So the, 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 basically the guy that looks like he's having the most fun he's the one that gets awarded with the blue jacket. It's not for the best score, best golfer. It's just the guy who looks like he's had the most fun. So there's a lot of stories that come along with that, but that became our annual fundraiser. And it went from, you know, being able to fund uh, one to two to three, four projects a year uh, to now, you know, we, we've been able to expand our operations where it's not just about operation home, where we're doing home remodels and, you know, uh, handicap uh, accessible entrances and, and, and exits it's now about operation education. And so we've got a program at Notre Dame called the Warrior Scholar Project. And it helps a lot of those active uh, duty service members who are either transitioning out or have an opportunity in between their service to come back, go through some intensive programs for two weeks to prepare them for starting, continuing, or finishing their education. We provide a scholarship for a Navy SEAL there at Notre Dame right now, Brian Duffy. We're incredibly proud of Brian. Uh, he's got a wonderful family and he's an absolute stud. Uh, and then we also work with the South Bend Homeless Shelter. They have a veteran center there, the Robert L. Miller Senior Center for Veterans. We provide programming in particular called the DRIVE program, which we helped start with Steve Camilleri, their executive director, to help a lot of those who are trying to get back up on their feet who are at a later stage and providing them the tools and resources 
uh, to, to kind of battle homelessness and be able to get back involved. And then Operation Joy is the last thing. That's just fun for us. You know, it's providing tickets. It's providing, you know, different things to uh, families in need, in particular around the holiday time, uh, so we can give back to a lot of those milita military families who need some help. And finally, folks, like to follow you, like to hear your analysis. So you're back on the Fox Collegiate uh, pregame show this fall. Will that be the next time people can see you in one of the commercial services? And what else <laughs> might you be involved in over the air this year? Yeah, so uh, I've, got a, I've got a long list of things that I'm doing. So uh, I'm, I'm working for Fox doing the, the college football pregame show. That's kind of as of now. There could be some other things that pop up. I also work for CBS Sports HQ. It's a digital platform where I do college football and NFL analysis for them. And then I'm on the radio. I do a, a weekly Sunday night show with Jonas Knox on Fox Sports Radio uh, from 8 to 11 Eastern. And then uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm on with Bruce Murray for the SiriusXM Blitz. Um, we, we, we do obviously covering the NFL uh, for the SiriusXM Radio. So a lot of different things going on, but obviously all around the game that I love football. Brady, thanks so much for the time. One of my memories of you is one most people may not have, but it was uh, – your last year here when you appeared on the Notre Dame football radio show and we didn't pre-announce it to try to get you in and out quietly. And by the time you appeared on the air, it was out in Granger on princess way. There was a line outside the building of people waiting to come in and meet you asking for autographs. Another story we shouldn't tell in a family show about a body part. One of the young ladies wanted you to autograph, but you were <laughs> just so classy and you stayed there you must have signed two or three hundred autographs that night and were gracious to each and every one of those fans i don't know how you could say no we didn't have enough security to keep them out not that we wanted to anyway but i've never seen anything like that before or after at a radio show just when people heard brady quinn was out in public they showed up to say hello well, it was a lot of fun. Obviously, I was very fortunate and blessed to go to Notre Dame. Um, it's, it's the best fan base and, and probably the uh, second best decision, because my wife might see this, uh, in my life that I made was going yeah. to Notre Dame. And obviously, the yes. first was marrying her. So yes. there we go. That, that, that is my disclaimer, so I don't get in trouble. But uh, that was um, – it, it was a special time. I always think back on it fondly. I think my, my biggest regret is not being able to bring a national championship – uh, but outside of that, so many friends, um, so many relationships were able to be built through that. And I think I, I grew a lot as a young man. Brady, thank you. Good luck uh, with your future endeavors. And again, you talked about the fan base. We started the game watch up for the month of May and the fans have responded to the level. We're going to keep it going. We'll be back next Saturday night. Haven't picked the game yet. Not sure who the analyst will be. You're always welcome, Brady. Uh, but we will see you again next Saturday night. So for Brady Quinn and executive producer Brock Rom, I'm Jack Nolan. Thanks so much for logging on tonight. And as always, go Irish.